Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome this, to this, the 23rd meeting in 2014 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Welcome to members, welcome to the Minister and his uh, officials, and welcome to people joining us in the gallery. And can I remind everyone, please, to turn off or at least turn to silent all mobile phones and other uh, electronic devices. We have apologies this morning from uh, Margaret McDougall, MSP. Uh, item one on the agenda, can I ask committee members if they're content to take item seven in private? Great, Great thank you. Uh, <coughs> item two uh, on the agenda, we have a legislative uh, consent memorandum to consider on the Small Business Enterprise and Employment Bill. And I would like to welcome to introduce this uh, Fergus Ewing, who is the Minister for Energy, Enterprise and Tourism at the Scottish Government who is joined uh, this morning by colleagues uh, David McPhee, who is Head of Business and Energy Unit, Office of the Chief Economic Advisor, uh, Neil McLeod, Principal Legal Officer, Solicitors Constitutional and Civil Law, Chris Boyland, who is Head of Strategic Reform and Accountant in Bankruptcy, and Elaine Drennan, Head of Employability, Skills and Lifelong Learning Analysis, Educational Analytical Services. Uh, welcome to you all. Minister, would you like to introduce this, uh, Elsie? Yes, thank you very much, convener. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm grateful for today's opportunity to address the committee in respect of the motion lodged by the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth on the 8th of August. As you know, the UK Small Business Enterprise and Employment Bill was introduced in the House of Commons on the 25th of June and will shortly begin its Westminster Committee stages. The bill aims to remove what are regarded as unnecessary impediments to business and includes a wide range of measures aimed at promoting economic growth. The majority of the provisions within the bill are reserved to the UK Parliament. What we are concerned with today are those provisions that fall within the devolved competence of this Parliament and which require a legislative consent motion to allow the UK Parliament to legislate for these matters. I will therefore concentrate specifically on the areas contained within this motion and will be happy to address any other queries out with today's proceedings in writing should the committee so require. <coughs> This LCM covers three areas, improving access to finance through the assignment, or as we say in Scotland, assignation of receivables. Secondly, sharing of information in relation to education and training. And thirdly, corporate insolvency. And I'll briefly outline each of these three areas. Firstly, the ban on assignment of receivables. The ban on assignment of receivables measure, as is referred to in the UK bill, a ban on assignation of receivables in Scots law is aimed at improving small businesses' access to finance by removing legal barriers that can prevent businesses from selling their invoices to a third-party finance provider, thereby improving liquidity and cash flow for small business and increasing prospects of sustainability and growth. Viable businesses need access to finance for investment and growth. The committee recognised this in their published report earlier this year entitled Access to Finance and Alternative Financing Models. This change is aimed at delivering a positive impact by nullifying the impact of clauses in business contracts that prohibit a business from selling their invoices to a third-party finance provider and in doing so should directly benefit small businesses. This provision affects contract law, which is within the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament and therefore requires the Scottish Parliament's consent. Secondly, the sharing of information in relation to education and training. The second measure outlined in the LCM is in relation to extending the sharing of information about individuals for the purposes of assessing the effectiveness of training and education. Existing legislation enables the Scottish Ministers, the Secretary of State and HMRC to share information about benefits, tax and education for the purposes of assessing the effectiveness of the provision of training and further education for those over the age of 18. It specifically excludes information about higher education. This measure will enable these assessment functions to include people who are under the age of 18 to capture all school leavers as well as those in higher education and will allow us to identify wage and employment outcomes for those who have undertaken training or further or higher education in Scotland. As this measure affects the assessment of education and training services, it falls within devolved competence and requires the Scottish Parliament's consent. The third and final area, convener, is co uh, corporate insolvency. This aims to reduce complexity and improve the efficiency of insolvency processes, which will reduce costs of administering insolvency proceedings and uh, potentially lead to higher returns for creditors. 
The UK government believes that the whole package, not just the insolvency measures outlined in the LCM, will benefit creditors by an estimated £30 million per annum. While the actual benefits remain to be seen, the aim clearly chimes with the principle that this government set out in the context of our Bankruptcy and Debt Advice Act to secure the best return for creditors by ensuring that the rights and needs of those in debt are balanced with the rights and needs of creditors and businesses. On that basis, we think that it is sensible that these measures should be extended to cover Scotland, given that these measures relate to devolved areas of corporate insolvency, receivership and the process of liquidation. They fall within the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament and therefore require legislative consent. A the committee should also note that there may be a supplementary legislative consent motion convener brought before them at a later date on public sector exit payments. The bill includes a provision to ensure exit payments are recovered when high earners return to the same part of the public sector within 12 months of leaving. It was agreed that, due to the complexity of this measure and its late addition to the bill, both UK and Scottish government officials would continue their discussions on the detail of the policy and the desirability of an LCM for this provision. If agreement is reached on the policy, we will lodge a supplementary LCM in due course. In conclusion, the Scottish Government is already creating a supportive business environment and has progressed a range of successful initiatives to deliver better regulation for all. In recognising that Scotland's businesses are the primary drivers of sustainable economic growth, we welcome policies which will complement um, our continuing programme to improve the performance of our businesses and make Scotland a more open and competitive place for companies to do business. I therefore ask the, convener, uh, ask the committee to support the draft legislative consent motion laid before it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Minister. Um, do members have any points they want to raise in relation to this? Mr Brody. Uh, Minister, good morning. Uh, I just want to be clarify one of the comments that you made about uh, selling on of debt in, in Presumably, we're talking about invoice discounting. What are the provisions suggested in the new legislation? Well, at present, we understand that in some contracts which routinely would be imposed, perhaps by larger businesses on smaller businesses, that there are contained in some of these contracts, and we, we have examples which, if members are interested, we can share with you, um, provisions which would prevent the small business from selling on to a third party any claim that they would have under the contract for money payable. We think that such an exclusion, such a ban on um, the assignation, the selling on of the right to, uh, to extract payment of a debt is not in the interest of business um, and that there's no justification for it uh, and that it's simply a, a practice that some large businesses have got into because they can and because, you know, in the, as I'm sure those of us who, who have had business, uh, uh, previous business experience will recall, big businesses tend to get their way, don't they? They tend to impose standard pro forma conditions. And if you don't like it, your choice is to lump it or leave it. Uh, and therefore, I think this is quite a good measure. Uh, I guess there's probably a more technical explanation hidden in these notes in front of me, but I hope that that... Uh, a, that sort of uh, punter's version will suffice. Yeah, well, one other question I may. With regard to the uh, recovery of exit payments for public servants, I'm not sure uh, what covenants there are in existence within the Scottish public uh, uh, sector to, to implement this. Is this a new provision, or do we already have within uh, Scottish uh, our, our management of the legislation that... Uh, I thought there were some covenants that explicitly stated that uh, people could not enter effectively the same service, uh, roughly the same, same salary as they, as they uh, exited previously. Um, well, I would hesitate to kind of generalise in such a wide area. I can certainly come back to the committee on this. Um, because we are not at the stage yet of knowing whether an LCM is required, um, we, we haven't, uh, uh, as yet, looked into issues such as the current, well, I have not as yet, at, at any rate, looked into the, the perfectly legitimate question, convener, which Mr Brodie raises us as to what precisely is the current position. What I undertake to do, since he's raised a perfectly reasonable question, is to look into that, qu that matter and write to the committee formally on it, irrespective of whether or not there is an LCM. 
Okay, any other members have any points they want to raise? Um, it does seem um, relatively uncontroversial, uh, Minister, and uh, bringing forward some sensible reforms. Uh, in that case, can I ask uh, the committee whether they are uh, minded to recommend that the Parliament give its consent to the relevant provisions of the Small Business Enterprise and Employment Bill as uh, set out in the LCM? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And are members happy to delegate to the, to the convener and clerk the production of a short factual report detailing the committee's considerations and arranging for its publication? Thank you. Right. We will now move on to item number three on the agenda. We'll have a very short suspension. I think we're having a change of officials. We can reconvene. Uh, the Minister has now been joined by uh, Claire Orr, who is the Executive Director, Policy and Compliance uh, at the Accountants and Bankruptcy. Uh, Chris Boyland uh, is still with us, and we're also joined by Graham Fisher from the Scottish Government Legal Directorate. Now, we have a, a raft of subordinate legislation to consider, Minister, as you'll be aware. Uh, we have uh, four uh, positive instruments. Uh, we have the Bankruptcy and Debt Advice Scotland Act 2014. Consequential Provisions Order 2014 in draft, the Bankruptcy Money Advice and Deduction from Income etc. Scotland Regulations 2014 in draft, the Common Financial Tool etc. Scotland Regulations 2014 in draft, and the Debt Arrangement uh, Scheme Scotland Amendment Regulations 2014 in draft. And we there, there, later will be considering three uh, negative instruments, the Bankruptcy Scotland Regulations 2014, SSI 2014-225, the Bankruptcy Applications and Decisions Regulations 2014, SSI 2014-226, and the Bankruptcy Fees Scotland Regulations 2014, SSI 2014-227. Uh, can I invite you, Minister, if you would speak to uh, and introduce these uh, instruments? Yes, thank you, Convener. I'll, I'll be brief as these are a complex set of instruments and the Committee has a lot to consider. The regulations before you today bring to life the provisions in the Bankruptcy and Debt Advice Scotland Act 2014. They form the next layer of our reforms. The most significant reforms, we believe, to bankruptcy in Scotland for a generation. And the four affirmative instruments you have been asked to consider will be invaluable in supporting measures, including the single common financial tool for Scotland and mandatory money advice for all debtors. As announced during the passage of the bill, the first set, the Common Financial Two Regulations, adopt the Common Financial Statement published by the Money Advice Trust as the heart of the Common Two Method for setting a fair debtor's contribution in Scotland. The next, the Money Advice and Deduction from Income ETC Regulations, fill in significant details about the role of money advisors and provide the forms for telling employers and others when deductions are made from income under the new provisions in the Act. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. The debt arrangement scheme regulations do two things. They make changes to the debt arrangement scheme to take account of the common financial tool and they extend the advantages of the scheme in making protected repayments to certain legal persons, including partnerships. The consequential provisions order makes technical amendments to other legislation as a consequence of the 214 Act replacing income payment orders with debtor contribution orders and changes to the provisions on debtors' discharge. Um, I'd like to make two general points. The first is about timings and consultation. I have heard some stakeholder views that we have not consulted properly and have rushed through these regulations. I'm surprised, convener, by some of these comments, particularly by ICAS. ICAS, for example, are the body that the accountant in bankruptcy has consulted with the most. They are represented on the CFT working group, the business DAS working group, and the Notes for Guidance Working Group, and they have seen every draft set of regulations that we have been able to share. 
My second point is about the guidance. There are three layers to a regulatory regime, primary legislation, secondary legislation and guidance. Each is perhaps as important as the other. Work on drafting the necessary guidance is well underway and I've heard some positive feedback on the collaborative way this is progressing. We will continue to work in partnership with stakeholders and listen to their concerns as we develop our guidance and operational processes. For example, we have again heard representations from ICAS and R3 that it would be helpful to have external persons involved in the new review process. If this will best serve the interests of openness and transparency, then I will say right now that I am happy to agree to this and to have a role for independent experts in the final review process that will be rolled out in April. I hope this demonstrates a convener in conclusion that neither our minds nor our doors are closed to stakeholders' views. We will continue to engage and we will continue to listen. And uh, I am happy to take any questions and uh, because I should say of the nature of the complexity of some of the regulations, my officials stand ready to answer the really hard ones. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, I, know, I know members have got some questions I want to ask about some issues of detail. Can, can I just, before we do that, just pick up on, on, on the general observation you made about consultation? Because we, we've had, uh, as a committee, submissions from, from ICAS, from uh, R3, from the Law Society, and from Step Change uh, Debt Charity Scotland, all of which have a, a common theme, um, expressing concern about the uh, rapid production process of these regulations and the lack of proper consultation on the detail. And I think all of these submissions make similar points about um, the manner in which consultation was, was conducted. Um, there were stakeholder events held, but they they felt that uh, the opinions that were expressed by stakeholders at these, uh, and despite the general support for those, these were not reflected in the regulations uh, as finally uh, drafted. And there remain very detailed and specific concerns about some of the measures here. I heard what you had to say earlier, but do you not appreciate that there is quite a lot of concern amongst the stakeholders here about um, the manner in which this has been brought forward? Well, yes, of course, I, I do understand that stakeholders have uh, concerns and we work extremely closely with them. I, I think the committee is aware of, of that from our extensive working together over the past three years in these matters. Uh, uh, we uh, are um, always keen to, to consult, to share views, to listen. At the end of the day, though, we have to decide and we have to implement the Acts of Parliament. We pass the law. It is there for a purpose. The common financial tool will end the disparity of having different measures of assessing how much, people sh how much debtors should pay by way of contributions to their income. It is ludicrous that we have in Scotland different systems for calculating contributions from income because inevitably, by definition, it leads to disparities and discrimination. And therefore, the policy of this Parliament convener is to get on with it and to implement a new system which is fairer to debtors. That is... That was manifest in the discussions in Parliament. Um, I mean, I, I do, though, however, want just to take each point in turn because, you know, I'm not satisfied that there is any real substance in the criticisms we've heard. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I do have, and I've gone to some lengths to, uh, to look at myself and study uh, personally the precise criticisms that were made by uh, the stakeholders, including step change, uh, who carry out, I may say, a terrific amount of good work in Scotland, helping tens of thousands of debtors. So their views plainly come from the, the, the sort of coal face of, of this work and deserve to be taken very seriously. Um, let me turn to some of the specifics. Um, the IB has consulted extensively in the development of these regulations. The IB has convened working groups, the CFT working group, the Business DAS working group, the Notes for Guidance working group, it's difficult to see how many more working groups you could possibly establish in such an area. But we have had bespoke working groups for each significant area of work. Also, the IB has consulted with the Charities Regulator, the Scottish Civil Justice Council and the Scottish Court Service. Uh, the AIB has also shared drafts of some of the regulations with members of the working groups and, and made significant changes as a result of that engagement. Uh, and I think the there were specific examples, the precise detail of which I've forgotten, but I'm sure if members wish to know, 
we can demonstrate some of the changes, and I alluded to one of them in my opening comments. The IB also held a series of stakeholder events in Glasgow. There were two in Glasgow, uh, one in Edinburgh, one in Inverness. And it's important to note that attendees at these events were entirely free at those events, convener, to ask whatever they wanted. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, stakeholder events did lead, I think, to significant uh, influence in the drafting of our approach. So um, I'm happy to do my best to answer any, any points of, of detail, but, um, but I think the, the concerns expressed by the stakeholders are perhaps a factor of the, of, of the reality that they are all concerned, as we are, to do our best uh, for um, those in debt in Scotland and also to balance that, that th th their interests with the rights of creditors. The ICAS, R3, CAS, Step Change and others care a lot about what they do. We respect that. They have a vital role to play and we work very closely with them, treat their views with respect. But at the end of the day, we the government, we must decide and we take the responsibility for that. Okay, thank you, Minister. Um, I know some members have got uh, questions, so I'll start with Dennis Robertson and then I'll bring in Richard Baker. Okay. Thank you, Convener, and uh, good morning, Minister. Um, uh, maybe just coming to Citizens Advice um, Scotland, um, one of their concerns, I think, was with regard to Section 4 uh, and with regard to um, those that provide uh, money advice. And obviously they, they are accredited. But there seems to be some concern around the, the gathering of certain information uh, and whether or not they will be able to do what is asked of them in terms of gathering the information um, that will be retained maybe for two years, given the chaotic lifestyle of, of some of the people that they're actually charged to provide advice for. Um, my understanding is that, that it's, it's a mandatory requirement. It, if that is the case, do you not think that we're actually making it very difficult for them? Because if they're unable to do that, my understanding is they could be suspended uh, as money advisors and therefore that would have a significant impact on them as individuals, obviously, but perhaps on organisations too. Well, I think there's, there's two points. Firstly, um, in relation to Cass's concerns that money advice and debtor contribution regulations give the IB powers to revoke or suspend the approval of a money advisor. I think that was the point that uh, Mr Robertson, convener, finished with. To take that point first... The IB would not revoke an advisor's approved status without notification, representation and the right to review that in court. You will recall, I think, convener and other members, that one of the issues that we discussed in the process and the discussion on the, uh, the bill was that there must be a right of appeal, that uh, there were concerns about some of the processes. And I made the point that, in principle, there is always a right of appeal or review, uh, and therefore... The, the idea that the, the, there is a sort of uh, uh, over-prescriptive or draconian powers, I think, needs to take account of the fact that that is subject to a right of review. Um, secondly, in relation to the detail of the um, a evidence, we, we have been perfectly cl clear all along that the regulations would be developed on the basis that money advisors should already be compliant with the existing requirements under the Type 2 Scottish National Standard for Information and Advice Providers, in particular, the requirement for advisors to, quotes, collect information from client social security tax credit sources, which enables an accurate multiple benefit tax credit check to be done manually or in computer and details kept on file. This being the case, there should not be any difficulties as the evidence gathering requirements are unlikely to change significantly from what is already a current uh, um, practice. Um, regulations 3 3 and 3 4 provide for discretion in the consideration of income and expenditure. Regulation 3 11 specifies that those using the common financial tool must have regard to guidance issued by the accountant in bankruptcy on matters relating to treatment of types of income and expenditure, how income and expenditure are to be verified by the money advisor and trustee, and the conduct of money advisors in carrying out their functions. So there is discretion built in. The powers in relation to suspension are subject to a right of review, and they would not ever be exercised lightly. Of course they would not. These are extremely serious matters. So um, some of these matters, I apologise, are extremely technical, uh, but they have been considered in detail and I think dealt with in a, in a satisfactory and fair fashion. 
Uh, from that minister, I can, uh, I, must, uh, I'm, I think I'm gathering that you're satisfied with the procedure at the moment that's actually in place because of the requirements of gathering particular information, and obviously there's many routes available uh, for that collection of information. But it was just on the aspect of people's chaotic lifestyles sometimes that there could potentially be still that problem of gathering that information. And if it is a mandatory requirement, it does put the money advisor in a, a, a quite a difficult position. Uh, are you satisfied there's enough flexibility in there to, to, to look at that and to, and to say, well, actually, everything possible has been done that could be done, so therefore we're satisfied? Yes, I am so satisfied. Um, there is flexibility built in, uh, and these are not new issues. You are quite correct, Mr Robertson is quite correct, to argue that it can be extremely difficult to obtain evidence of income and expenditure from those who may have, for example, chaotic lifestyles. These are practical difficulties. Uh, those involved in doing the work and money advisors are well acquainted with these difficulties. This has always been a, a practical matter that has to be dealt with, uh, and it will continue to be dealt with with the degree of flexibility that's required. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Okay. Brody wants to follow that up. If I may, just to, just to follow that up. I mean, one of the questions that we raised, or was raised, um, was the what were the implications for compulsory money advice on the free money advice sector? Uh, and it was agreed that the government would um, conduct research into this. I just wonder what has been the outcome of that research and how, given the flexibility and, and, the, and the complications of trying to collate information, exactly what, uh, how we intend to control, in inverted commas, the free money advice sector in these circumstances. What research has been done and what has been the outcome? Just clarify the research into into what exactly. The impact of the compulsory money advice centre on, on the free money advice sector. <coughs> um, well, the, the accountant of bankruptcy I'm advised on behalf of the Scottish Government in conjunction with members of the money advice sector will develop a research framework which will allow the Scottish Government to monitor the impact of the new legislation. And once the findings of this research have been reviewed, the Scottish Government will consider whether any changes to the legislation or associated guidance is necessary. I, I, I thank you, Minister, for, for, for that. But, uh, you're saying that they will conduct research. Uh, am I, well, I can only assume that this research has not been started and uh, when the guidelines are issued in December that we... Uh, Maybe missing that important factor. Um, well, may maybe I'm misunderstanding the member's questioning, but because we're six months away from the implementation of the uh, new provisions, by definition, there cannot be any analysis of how it's how it is performing. I mean, the, we uh, are working extremely hard to prepare the way uh, for the. Uh, regulations which are before you today for the guidance which uh, is being brought forward uh, and will be shared with stakeholders as soon as possible, some of it later this month. Uh, but it is not yet in place, so um, obviously no, no assessment, no research can be carried out into how it operates. Uh, so that, that will be something that we will look at very carefully after the provisions do come into force and the system comes into effect. I, I have every confidence that the accountant of bankruptcy will perform her functions in respect of the implementation of the badass bill, as it's known in the street, uh, just as effectively and competently as they perform all their other functions. We are extremely fortunate in Scotland to have, in the accountant of bankruptcy, uh, a very highly motivated and effective group of public servants who do a terrific job uh, in handling quite difficult and sensitive matters. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Can I uh, acknowledge the, um, the broad support there is, the general direction of policy in this area. 
Um, but um, you mentioned the submission we've had from ICAS. Now, they say they've taken part in the working groups, and it's welcome you've established working groups, but the, the point of the matter is they say that the comments they've made through those consultation events and working groups have not been acknowledged or properly addressed by the Scottish Government in these regulations. And they actually feel that um, the impact regulations would be to make the debt arrangement scheme a less attractive debt management solution, which would seem to me to be counter <coughs> to the, the, the where we should be going, um, I think, with general agreement in terms of the, the policy area. Now, ICAS have recommended that we consider the rejection of all the regulations at this stage, um, but I'm also looking at the submission from Step Change that you mentioned. Now, they, uh, instead of asked for um, a more realistic timetable for implementation, for more consultation, what they say is proper consultation and detailed guidance, and not only within the working groups, but have also um, uh, asked that amended regulations should be drafted if these proceed. Is that something you would consider? Well, we, we think it's important that these regulations are passed and uh, are passed today, and that's, that's why I'm here. Um, first of all, if I could just respond in relation to um, the, the general point that Mr Baker makes in relation to ICAS, and I think other stakeholders too, and it is simply not the case that the IB has ignored the views of the working group. In fact, the IB has made a number of substantive changes to the draft regulations on the basis of the working group's feedback. They have listened and they have responded, uh, and these have included, and I've got eight specifics. Um, I will share this note, which has eight specific examples, um, convener, but because I, I don't think that the time should be taken up, perhaps, with ultra-technical matters, but... Um, but these are highly specific points that were put to the AIB as criticisms by the stakeholders, and I can give you eight specific examples of changes that were put to the AIB and adopted. So, I mean, I think the general charge is is not really a valid, uh, and the impact were we not to pass these regulations today would be would mean that we would not be able to go on with providing the the. the uh, um, the the uh, a, a benefits of the changes that we need to make. The AIB has worked extremely hard to provide as much time as possible for training and familiarisation of these changes before they are brought into effect. And in specifically in terms of timing, the regulations were laid in August in order to give the sector early sight of them, convener. I mean, it's not always the case that uh, regulations are, are consulted upon in this way, but the fact that they have been brought forward, I, I would hope, would be taken as a sign of the good faith of, uh, of everybody involved. The AIB has allowed more than seven months between the laying of the regulations and their coming into force. By comparison, in 2011, the DAS regulations came into effect only four months after they were laid. So, and these regulations is almost twice as long for the sector to familiarise themselves with the changes, many of which are of a sort of technical and clerical nature in respect of forms and so on, which are completed uh, uh, by uh, email, electronic means in any event. Uh, but seven months to prepare does seem to me to be a reasonable time to, to prepare. And, uh, you know, I, I therefore feel that, um, you know, perhaps they, they doth protest too much. The, the point they're making is that, particularly from ICAS, is that if regulations go through unaltered, it might make debt arrangement a less attractive option. Now, surely that can't be what a Scottish government wants. What would really be the detriment in um, uh, taking back the regulations now, taking on board these very practical concerns, which they say will make a very real difference to the scheme, uh, and, and resubmitting them once these points have been taken on board? Or is it the fact that you just don't agree any changes should be made, Minister? Um, well, I, I was just consulting with officials here, and I might actually, with your permission, bring in Claire Orr, because I don't think um, Mr Baker has actually specified precisely why ICAS think that DAS won't work or won't work effectively. Um, perhaps... Well, that's in the, that's in the ICAS submission, to be fair, Minister. I mean, they've laid out a well, number of different concerns. Well, you haven't said why, why, what the basis of their argument is, but perhaps they Claire have. Orr could do so and... And see why we don't accept that. If that's if that's in order, I think, help us get to the nub of things. 
I think one of the issues was around about the five-year limit on the repayment of the, the debt, and we deemed that that was appropriate because, bearing in mind that this is not an insolvency solution, there's a requirement to reach an agreement with creditors about what is reasonable. Therefore, it would be fair to set a limit on the, the time that was available for the repayment. Um, I think that was that was probably the, the main issue. Um, there was also an issue about the, the all debts having to go into the debt payment programme. And this is an issue that we're actually changing for all of the, the debt arrangement schemes, which ensures that we don't create any unfair preference for any other creditors. So all of the debts are included. But the caveat that we have made for that is that that would only be the case where the debt had been constituted as being due. Therefore, it did provide sufficient flexibility if there was an arrangement with um, suppliers, for example, uh, for continuation of supply of stock, then that would continue to be possible because um, the debt wouldn't have been called up as being due to be paid and therefore that could be excluded. So we think we've addressed the main points which ICAS suggests make the scheme not an attractive option uh, by making those changes. It's true to say as well that the, the current debt arrangement scheme was a very slow starting solution. In the first couple of years of its operation, there weren't significant numbers, but if you look now at the growth of that solution, there's over 4,500 applications per year. It's grown year on year, and that might be what we would expect to happen with this solution as well. Thank you very much for that answer. And finally, Convener, clearly there's a, a disagreement here between ICAS and Ministers over the impact regulations. And they also, uh, in their submission, which you must have had, Minister, have uh, uh, concerns of what they call the inappropriate <laughs> regulation of money advisors, which <coughs> relates to the points which Mr Robertson made earlier. So can I just be clear that if these regulations proceed today, you, you don't have any intention to amend them further uh, if you have... Um, consultation, as you said you would do, which is welcome, with stakeholders subsequently to these regulations being passed <coughs> or otherwise. Um, you know, you, you, you've no intention of bringing forward any amendments regulations in light of any consultation. Um, well, obviously, we'll, we will keep matters closely under review, but we, we do believe that we have listened carefully to the individual points of uh, stakeholders. And I, I mean, I have a, a lot of uh, of detail here about individual points that ICAS have put and the responses there too. Um, so we do think that, that the um, regulations as proposed will do the job. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I would remind Mr Baker that, you know, DAS is, to which he refers, is one of the most effective tools that there has been in the uh, whole process of uh, debt management, the process of encouraging the payment of debts by ordinary individuals has been, I think, a great success story in Scotland and looked, looked from our friends south of the border, peering over Hadrian's Wall with some envy about how well it has done. And uh, I should say that Mr Baker's uh, uh, party, when it was administration, brought it in and, and we have developed and worked on it to approve it. And I think... Uh, about a decade of performance has seen it work extremely well. I don't think there's any reason to suspect that the success of DAS will be impeded in any way by these regulations. Quite the opposite. The common financial tool will, int will introduce fairness and consistency, something which has been a, a lacking in the current system with a, a plethora of different options. So I take Mr Baker's point very seriously. Of course, we will continue to listen carefully to ICAS. Of course, they will continue to serve on the various working groups that I've referred to uh, and in bringing forward the guidance. And the, the guidance convener, as you will know from solvency work in the past, is, uh, deals with nitty-gritty practical points and always has done. And in bringing forward the guidance and in adjusting the guidance, of course, we will listen extremely carefully to the opinions of ICAS and R3 in behalf of insolvency practitioners, and practitioners in Scotland. Uh, and rightly so. Thank you. Uh, Mike uh, thank you, Convener. Um, <clears throat> good morning, Minister. Um, w w one, of the, one of the things the committee, I think, were very impressed with during our scrutiny of the bill was the, um, the inherent flexibility that's built into the common financial tool to take account of different circumstances. Um, but the, a point that's made both by Step Change and Citizens Advice 
uh, Scotland um, is a concern, I think, that's maybe got some merit, and it's uh, um, a concern that the Common Financial Tool has sufficient flexibility to allow um, them to continue to encourage um, their clients to uh, undertake an element of <coughs> savings, some small build up, some small savings to provide resilience for them and enable them to, um, you know, uh, weather weather um, the kind of storms that uh, they may have to uh, financially. Um, but while still maintaining payments and so on. And I wonder if you could uh, reassure us that the uh, Common Financial Tool uh, does have that flexibility to allow them to encourage their clients to um, save a, a small amount and uh, uh, you, you know, ensure good practice in that regard. Um, yes, I, I can. And this... Mr. Mackenzie gets to, to the heart of, of matters, not, not for the first time. Uh, th there is discretion and flexibility built in. Uh, I looked very carefully at the step change criticisms. I obtained a detailed uh, response from officials. I then obtained uh, supplementary responses to a whole set of questions that I had about this, specifically to identify precisely where that flexibility and latitude is built in. So just for, for, for the record, in relation to details of the evidence required, uh, the uh, regulations 3.3 and 3.4 provide specifically for discretion in the consideration of income and expenditure. Regulation 3.11 specifies that those using the CFT must have regard to guidance issued by the accountant in uh, bankruptcy. Uh, in relation to prescriptiveness of triggers, which was a specific point raised both by State Change and ICAS about the effect of para regulation 3.2, uh, the response is that regulation 3.3 provides for expenditure which exceeds uh, trigger figures if satisfied expenditure is reasonable. So again, there are in the regulations, convener, I've just given a few examples. Um, specific provision for latitude, flexibility and reasonableness. And this is correct because it is quite impossible to have uh, entirely prescriptive regulations which allow no flexibility because there are so many different situations that occur in real life out there. Um, so I'm very pleased Mr McKenzie has, has raised this important issue and I am satisfied that the, there are built into the regulations um, sufficient discretion, latitude and flexibility to allow uh, money advisors to do their job properly and fairly. Above all, it's not us, the money advisors, ICAST we're concerned about, it's the people involved get treated fairly. That is the, the aim of the common financial tool, to make sure that people aren't required to pay more than is fair or reasonable, but they are required to pay a sufficient sum towards their debts as they are able to do according to their means. So uh, thank you for asking that. And I, I do believe that um, the, the uh, regulations do provide the, the necessary flexibility that is needed. Thank you, Minister. OK. Um, other members? Alison Johnson. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, Section 8 of the Money Advice and Deduction from Income regulations applies to deductions from debtors' earnings. Is it the case that the regulations allow for earning deductions after two payments without the requirement for the debtor to be informed in writing? I mean, Citizens' Advice in their submissions speak about, you know, sometimes, um, you, you know, an unexpected family death, for example, could, could involve funeral costs and... For a debtor to end up without his or her knowledge with earning deductions, um, it, it doesn't seem characteristic of something that we want to be seen as a financial health service. I'm sorry, can you just repeat the last bit, uh, please? Yes, I suppose it's just the fact that if, if um, your earnings are reduced with an unexpected deduction and you haven't been informed in writing, it could really put you in a, you know, a, a very serious position, which seems at odds with the drive to make this a financial health service. I think we debated this, did we not, in the passage of the legislation as to what a sort of reasonable system was. And, uh, and I thought that the solution we came up with in the primary legislation was reasonable. Um, but in terms of the specific provision, I'm asking if uh, Clare Orr could perhaps address the 
specific points that have been put here with permission, Convener. And we're very happy to build into the guidance the, the reinforcement of the safeguards that are in the legislation, which provide for that measure only to happen after there has been two missed payments. Um, we looked at what's currently happening in protected trust deeds, where there is already the ability to deduct directly from earnings, and what the practice is, is it's happening at the outset with the debtor's consent, and that suggests that the debtor themselves actually finds it helpful for that arrangement to be put in place, because it means that the they no longer then have to worry about making that ongoing arrangement themselves. But we do understand the point that um, CAS are making and we'd be very happy to ensure that the guidance reflects appropriate um, procedures for that. Thank you. I think we'll write to you on that, you know, just because that's a very fair point and I'm concerned to make sure that we get it absolutely correct, as we will do, but uh, just to, to make sure that that's the case, we will, we will write to you after we've uh, made progress in the guidance. Okay. Thank you. Other members? Yeah, just, uh, uh, just a, a very brief point, Minister. Um, with re reference to the guidance, um, uh, from my understanding of what you've said this morning, that you will be taking on board uh, some of the concerns that are still out there, and this will be reflected through continuing uh, a working relationship with the various working groups. Um, and this will eventually be reflected in the guidance, taking on board what you can, obviously, um, from the concerns that have been raised, and uh, and you know the flexibility that Mr. McKenzie was refer uh, referencing to the financial tool. All this will be very implicit within the guidance. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I can give you that um, uh, that assurance. Um, I think the, the the general response is that a, a draft of the guidance document uh, in relation to the com co common financial tool um, will be shared with stakeholders uh, during this month in October. I was just looking for the precise document that uh, set out step changes concerns, which I think alluded to December as being the time when they would get sight of this. But in fact, I, I queried that because I thought perhaps a little more notice would have been required and I was advised that a draft of the guidance document will be shared with the Common Financial Tool Working Group of which step changes a member during this month. So you know that, that will allow um, time for discussion and uh, you know I will personally, because of my interest in making sure that we get the guidance correct, uh, take a, a very close interest in this convener and uh, I'm very happy if members so wish to undertake to report back on, on the issues that members have raised in the course of today's proceedings because we do take them very seriously. But there will be um, a lot of time for joint working uh, in relation to the common financial tool because it is absolutely essential that the guidance is correct. Thank you. Um, Chick Woody. Yes. I apologise for my coughing interludes. Um, just associated with, perhaps not a question for you, Minister, but for, for, for one of the officials. Um, we advised in, in, in the briefing that, in fact, we had part of the conversation in the bill, that the electronic application uh, would reduce the administrative burden um, because the user would only visit pages appropriate to the individual customer based on whatever information was provided. The implications of the briefing we have is that there has not been sufficient time and resources for training before implementation. Is that the case? Uh, and if so, how do we intend to recover the, the whole need for training uh, to, uh, as a catch-up? Um, well, the, the AIB has worked pretty hard to, to provide as much time as possible for training and familiarisation. Um, and I've alluded to the fact the regulations were laid in August in order to allow the sector early sight of them. I've alluded to the fact that there will be seven months before they, they come into force. The IB is developing a training programme which will include awareness sessions to be delivered at various locations across Scotland. The IB will upload training videos and instructions on their website and they're building a training system which will be web-based and will allow users to log on from their offices or homes to try out the system 
the AIB will be training business champions from amongst its own staff who will be able to visit individual offices to conduct training sessions if uh, required. Um, and therefore, the AIB is, is fairly well advanced in, in, uh, a, a, in this matter. So, um, yes, it's a perfectly legitimate concern, but I'm satisfied that uh, um, the AIB, in accordance with its customary practice, is uh, fo focusing uh, clearly and well on the net necessity of providing the tools that are required for the practitioners to continue to do their job uh, uh, professionally. Can I maybe just ask, lastly, in relation to the uh, negative instruments that we have before us, Minister, um, we had a report from the uh, Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee in relation to uh, two of these instruments, the uh, Bankruptcy Scotland Regulations 2014, that's SSI 2014-225, and then the Bankruptcy Fees Scotland Regulations 2014, SSI 2014 uh, stroke 227, that in relation to both of these, there were uh, a number of drafting errors drawn to our attention by the DPLR committee and failures to follow uh, normal uh, drafting practice. I wonder, Minister, if you have any um, intention of um, resolving these errors, for example, by bringing forward amended instruments in, in due course. Um, well, I, I'm happy to agree, as the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee asked on Tuesday, that we'll make the further amendments to the Bankruptcy Scotland Regulations 214 and Fees Regulations, which the Committee asked for um, last week. I would stress that the DPLRC did not consider those points defective drafting, <coughs> but noted the changes would provide better clarity and consistency, and no adverse consequences would have arisen from any of these points, but the necessary amendments to deal with these matters shall be brought forward. Okay, thank you. Minister. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other points to make, we can move on to the next item on the agenda. Uh, we move on to uh, item uh, four, uh, the uh, formal debate on the uh, affirmative instruments before us. And I wonder if I could invite you, uh, Minister, if you would uh, formally move uh, the four instruments, S4M 11068, S4M 11069, S4M uh, 11070 and S4M 11071. So moved. Thank you, Minister. Do any members wish to speak uh, in relation to these motions? Uh, right, McKenzie. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. I would like, first of all, to say that in reading the, the written submissions from the various interested parties, I was struck that a number of the submissions were not dealing with these instruments that are in front of us today, but actually revisiting a number of issues that were dealt with in our scrutiny of the bill. And um, whilst it was uh, good, I suppose, to be reminded of some of that scrutiny, I think a lot of what they were concerned about is out with the scope of what we're talking about today. But I do think it's worth... Um, the committee reminding ourselves that our feelings uh, about the bill, uh, the badass bill, were benign. Um, we felt it was a good bill. It was well disposed to debtors and to creditors. And the a AIB, I think, have shown themselves to be well disposed to debtors and to creditors. And uh, I'd like to just place on record my own thanks to AIB because in dealing with some constituents' problems, um, I found AIB to be refreshingly helpful um, and predisposed towards helping debtors who were in difficult situations and exploring innovative uh, ways of doing that. So I'm assured that AIB are well disposed um, and I think... Uh, y you know, that's not something that you get a proper sense of in some of the written submissions that, that we've received. Um, I'm particularly struck that the written submission from ICAS seems to me to be a situation whereby they're looking into the shadows and seeing bogeymen and monsters which may in fact not be there. I think when I read these instruments, I don't really see any shadows. I see one or two perhaps grey areas, and I think those grey areas will be resolved when the guidance uh, is available. And I'm uh, delighted that the Minister's saying that 
I was told us this morning that that guidance will be available very shortly, and I hope that will put some of the fears to rest that we've heard from some of the respondents. So I'm very pleased by the Minister's reassurances this morning, and I think there's an urgency. We do need to get on and implement this sooner rather than later, and I think not least because the UK government on related matters has seems to have moved very, very slowly, for instance, uh, to, to deal with the matter of payday loans. And it seems to me that, although they're eventually moving in the right direction, I hope, um, they have taken rather longer than any of us would have hoped to do that. So I think there's all the more reason that the Scottish Government gets on and implements these as soon as possible. And uh, I would urge all members to, you know, to vote in favour of the motion this morning. Let's go on and ease the burden on debtors and provide a better service also for creditors. Thank you. Um, firstly, can I, can I again acknowledge the broad support for the overall policy direction in this very important area for helping people with um, serious money uh, financial uh, issues uh, and the. Um, now, the minister was quite right to praise the debt arrangement scheme, uh, and um, you know that's why I think it's you know very important that we take seriously the views of ICAS, who, after all, are, have great expertise in this area, who uh, have a, a long history of um, working with the Scottish government in this important area of legislation. Who say that they fear that these proposals may make the debt arrangement scheme uh, less uh, attractive. Yeah, I'll take an intervention from Mr. Mackenzie. Do you welcome, as I do, the proposed extension of the debt arrangement scheme? to include small businesses, sole traders. Do uh, you feel that's a step in the right direction? Well, the point of the matter is that uh, ICAS have addressed these issues in their submission. They have highlighted a number of concerns about the regulations which have been brought before us, and I think we as a committee should take those very seriously. And Indeed, a number of the issues they bring forward are also brought forward by Citizens Advice Scotland uh, and... Um, a step change uh, debt charity as well. So I think they must be listened to. I mean, I, I think my fundamental point is that I want to welcome the fact that the minister said he will engage in further consultation in the event of these um, regulations going through. I know he will do that. I hope it's got taken forward seriously and that people are not only consulted but, but listened to and, uh, and the concerns expressed here seriously uh, addressed. But, but I fail to see, convener, I think it's my fundamental point, what would have been lost, actually. And this is where I depart from Mr McKenzie's point in, 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 in taking these regulations back at this point, we're drawing them out and actually going into further consultation, further dialogue, you know, materially addressing these concerns. We don't have these, this level of concern brought to us in submissions at the committee at this point. Um, and I think, from my point of view, that simply would have been a better way for the Scottish Government to proceed. Okay. Dennis Robertson. Very briefly, convener. Um, can I say that uh, I'm, I'm actually very reassured by the statements the Minister gave um, earlier with reference to guidance and um, his assurance that he will be listening um, and continuing to listen and take on board uh, submissions from all parties, uh, as has been done, I believe, uh, through this whole process. And certainly when this committee was taking evidence, um, I think we, we looked at the issues thoroughly um, during that period of evidence. So I'm, I'm very content that the uh, issues probably raised by, uh, that are raised by Mr Baker here uh, can actually be dealt with through the guidance process. Uh, and I, um, I'm content that we've had that reassurance from the Minister today. Okay. Thank you. Any other members wish to contribute? Um, for, for my part, I should say I do have some sympathy with Mr Baker's points. Um, having read the uh, submissions, um, there are some strong um, expressions of concern about the lack of uh, consultation uh, in relation to the preparation of these uh, instruments and uh, the way they've been brought forward. And I think the Minister should reflect upon that. Minister, I'd invite you to uh, respond, uh, if you would. Uh, well, well, thank you. I'm grateful for the members' contributions in the debate and working together with the committee to scrutinise the legislation is an essential part of bringing, bringing it forward in the best way. And uh, I, I would reiterate that we will continue to consult in extremely detailed fashion with all the stakeholders. We place on record the fact that we respect the work that they all do and value that work. And uh, therefore, we have changed the regulations in a number of ways. And I will specifically write to the committee to demonstrate that we have done so in a number of technical matters. 
uh, 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 and uh, we have consulted with the stakeholders, with the draft regulations, with three working groups. Uh, we will bring forward the guidance and draft. They will have seven months to consider it. These seem to, to me to be the way that we should proceed with government and a, a reasonable performance in relation to fairly technical matters. On the wider issues that have been raised by members, um, uh, I'm very grateful for Mr Mackenzie's remarks. I'm sure that uh, Rosemary will, Winter Scott will be pleased to, to hear them. I will make sure that she is made aware of them and her staff, who do an excellent job, will uh, receive recognition from Mr Mackenzie for the work that they do. I hope that the wider sector will also acknowledge the good work that the AIB do. I think it is time that we move forward and recognise that these public servants are, as Mr Mackenzie rightly says, doing a very difficult job in highly sensitive cases in an effective way, and indeed effective in terms of the financial operation of the accountant and bankruptcy. Uh, that is, uh, I think, an example of uh, sound and effective public administration. So uh, I'm very grateful to Mr Mackenzie for those remarks. Um, I, I do think that, convener, the, the uh, objections have, little, have been over-egged slightly by ICAS. I have to say that. Um, and uh, that we, we are, to some extent, revisiting arguments that were fully debated and discussed during the passage of the legislation. I don't think that's why we're here today. I don't think it serves any purpose. But be that as it may, um, we will continue to listen carefully to what they say and to respond as appropriate. The last thing I would say is that... Uh, over the period of the referendum, I had the opportunity to have fairly detailed meetings with the Citizens Advice Bureau, and uh, I'm hugely impressed with the work that they do to help the people that have least in society. The problems out there in relation to benefits are appalling. The delays, not as a result of any failure on the part of public officials in Scotland in administering, and particularly applications for benefits related to disability, are utterly scandalous and causative of very real hardship. And therefore, these matters are not just words on a page, technical matters, but are extremely important for people who face enormous financial hardship, the like of which none of us in this room, I suspect, uh, are familiar with, uh, are extremely important matters. And I'm seriously concerned about the administration of benefits payments in Scotland seriously concerned. It is frankly shambolic and the UK must take steps to deal with that. I just mention that because this is directly related to the issue of debt and it should be said. Finally, in relation to the, uh, uh, the, the purpose of these regulations and the, the legislation that we passed in 2014, we want to see a financial NHS in Scotland and that's why we're getting on with this. We want there to be a financial NHS so that that uh, young people in Scotland increasingly can be more effectively educated about how to manage their money, and they are not uh, falling prey to the sharks involved in some of the excessive interest charged in money lending activities and payday loans, which for far, far too long were left almost entirely unregulated, despite the fact that the very first debate that I did, members debate, was on payday loans in 2011, when Margaret Burgess brought her enormous experience to bear in this topic in 2011. It took three years for the obvious steps to be taken, and these have seriously exacerbated the problems that money advisors and Citizens Advice Bureau face. They deal at the sharp end with hugely difficult cases. Many, many human tragedies underlie all these statistics. So I'm very pleased that we are doing something good today, convener, and I very much hope that uh, uh, members will support these regulations. Okay, thank you, Minister. Uh, and I need to put the questions. Uh, the first question is that motion S4M 11068 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. No. Okay, there shall be a, a division. Those in favour of S4M 11068, please show. One, two, three, four, five, six. Those against, please show. Any abstentions? Okay, so that is agreed. Second question is that motion S4M11069 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. 
Okay, there will be a division. Uh, those in favour, please show. Six. Those against, please show. Abstentions. Okay, that is agreed. Third question is that motion S4M11070 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No, agreed. Okay, there will be a division. Uh, those in favour, please show. Six. Those against. Zero. Abstentions. Two. Oh, that's agreed. And the fourth question is that motion S4M11071 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No, agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Six. Six. Those against. And abstentions. Two that is agreed. Uh, now, can I ask if the committee are content that the convener and clerk will produce a short factual report of the committee's decisions and arrange to have it published? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, now we may now move to item five, which is consideration of uh, three negative instruments, the Bankruptcy Scotland Regulations 2014, SSI 2014 uh, slash 225, the Bankruptcy Applications and Decisions Regulations 2014, SSI 2014 226, and the Bankruptcy Fees Scotland Regulations 2014, SSI 2014 slash 227. The Minister uh, previously uh, indicated that action would be taken in relation to the uh, drafting issues identified by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee in relation to two of these uh, instruments. Do members have any uh, substantive issues they want to raise uh, other than that in relation to these, or are they content simply to note the instruments? Content. Content to note. Okay. Thank you very much. That concludes that item of business, um, and I can thank the Minister and his officials for their attendance, and we will have a five-minute suspension.
If we can uh, reconvene, um, I'd like to welcome uh, our next panel of witnesses as we move on to draft budget scrutiny for 2015-2016. In fact, this is our first uh, evidence session in relation to the draft budget. And can I uh, welcome, uh, joining us this morning, uh, we have Ian McTaggart, who's General Manager and Company Secretary at the Scottish Council for Development and Industry, uh, James Withers, who is Chief Executive of Scottish Food and Drink, Stephen Boyd, Assistant Secretary of the Scottish Trades Union Congress, and Gary Clark, Head of Policy and Public Affairs, Scottish Chambers of Commerce. Welcome to you all. We are um, slightly uh, unusual place in relation to the uh, draft budget scrutiny because the draft budget has not yet been published. However, I think we're expecting that tomorrow. Um, uh, and just because of the way the timetables uh, for parliamentary business have worked out, we are uh, starting our scrutiny uh, a little bit before uh, the budget is actually published. But I'm grateful to you all for uh, coming along this morning, and I think we'll allow about uh, up to about 90 minutes for this session. And if, and if I can remind members, if they would, to keep their questions short uh, and to the point, and answers as short and to the point uh, as possible would allow us to get through the, the topics in the time available. And because we have quite a large panel this morning, I think rather than uh, people just ask their questions generally to all panel members, it would be helpful if they could perhaps initially direct them to one member of the panel. And then if you want to come in in response to something asked to another panel member, if you just catch my eye and I'll bring you in as, as, uh, as best I can and as time allows. I wonder if I could just start um, and put a question to you all. Um, I'll maybe just start with Ian McTaggart and work my way along. Uh, we haven't yet seen the Scottish Government's budget, but it is being published tomorrow. Uh, from your own perspective and in view of the sector and interests that you represent, what are the key uh, features you would like to see in Mr Swinney's budget tomorrow? I'd like to start with Ian McTaggart. Yes, thank you. I think um, SCDI would be most interested in any measures, measures that support sustainable economic growth, and probably under three broad areas measures which support um, greater innovation and R&D exploitation in the economy, including commercialisation of the research, the excellent research we have from the university base in Scotland. The second area would be around productivity and skills. And the third area would be infrastructure and connectivity, uh, which is probably one area where we feel a lot could be done to support greater connectedness within the economy and connectedness with um, the markets that we're trying to serve. So measures really supporting those around um, aviation services, around road and rail links, connecting, for example, Aberdeen in a much better way to the rest of Scotland, and obviously our links with um, the key London airports and the key international hubs around Europe. Those will be initial thoughts. OK, thank you. James Withers. Um, I, I would agree with what Ian says, um, so I won't um, add anything in terms of cross-sectoral issues. I think from a food and drink perspective, um, the model we've got in terms of operation in Scotland now is, is quite a neat one, and one actually I think that other countries are now starting to replicate, where we've got some good industry leadership with then public sector alignment behind it. So we've got all the sectors of food and drink from whiskey, red meat, salmon and seafood to bakery and dairy agreed on a single growth plan. Uh, we've got a, a £16.5 billion target set for 2017 and we're clear on what the capability building areas are that we need to invest in. So it would be similar issues that, that Ian outlined. It's about innovation, collaboration uh, and the skills agenda as well. Um, from our perspective, market development is absolutely critical. So we think there's at least a billion pounds of growth in food and drink for Scottish companies in the UK market and about £1.4 billion uh, to be got at uh, international markets. Um, so the export agenda in particular is a transformational opportunity for food and drink. Um, there's a new export plan in place and we've got a partnership uh, where industry are putting some money on the table um, which should be matched by SDI and we're looking for ministerial support as well which we have in principle for the delivery of that. So um, there's quite a clear framework in terms of where we think we need to invest money. Um, I'd say a huge amount of investment that's gone into food and drink capability building measures over the last um, few years uh, and is paying off in terms of the growth we've got. So it's uh, more of the same is really our message. Okay, thank you. Stephen Boyd. 
Yeah, but obviously the SDC is a slightly different kind of organisation and we do have a range of our interest cover, I guess, the full gamut of what will be published tomorrow in the budget. I'll try and confine myself to comments that this committee will be interested in and that I personally might know something about. Uh, I mean, and in doing so, I'm happy to endorse the comments that uh, Ian and James have already made. Clearly, the funding of economic development in Scotland is you know, as much a priority for the SDCs as it is for these other organisations. Uh, I think I mean, where we might have a particular perspective is maybe around about, you know, if you look at what's happening in the labour market at this moment in time, we see employment higher than we might have anticipated, given what we've been through over the last few years. But we've seen a historically unprecedented collapse in real wages. So whatever the Scottish government might be able to do through the budget to support wages in Scotland, I think would be uh, very helpful. Uh, I think it's it's interesting that, you know, two things. One, the white paper contained some very interesting proposals about the management of the labour market in Scotland. It'll be interesting to see which of those the Scottish Government might want to pursue under the current devolution arrangements. And secondly, they ourselves and the Scottish Government published the Joint Working Together review a couple of months ago in August, which we see has been a very important development and you know, a development which requires, I think, some funding through the budget to make the the proposals work. I think we're talking probably very small sums in the, the grand scheme of things in terms of the Scottish budget. But if uh, you know unions, employers and government are going to work more closely together to support innovation, support higher productivity, then some you know budgets might be appropriate, I think, to implement there. So that would be our I guess our, our priority. Okay. Thank you. Um, Gary Clark. Um, obviously, a central purpose of, of the Scottish Government is to uh, support uh, sustainable economic growth, and, and we would expect uh, measures aimed towards that. I think, importantly for us, uh, at a very important time in the, the economic recovery phase, uh, we're looking at measures that will support uh, business investment, we're looking at measures that will support business growth. Um, particularly. Uh, I think there's a number of uh, ways that uh, the government could uh, tackle those. I think particularly supporting business-to-business uh, -business connections, both in terms of internationalisation um, and in terms of uh, business support uh, are key areas. Um, uh, tackling business costs, so uh, obviously business rates is one of the main taxes there. Obviously there will be other taxes uh, this time around uh, in the budget um, and supporting and continuing to support the investment that has taken place uh, in our uh, infrastructure and particularly transport infrastructure over the past few years. We want to see that continue and we want uh, I think it's an opportunity for the government to tackle. Um, it's got a lot of the big ticket items under its belt. Uh, it's time to tackle some of the, the smaller areas which have uh, very important uh, um, impacts on particular local areas across Scotland. Okay. Thank you. Just before I, I bring in uh, Dennis Robertson, I just want to ask a, a follow-up question if I can. Um, both, both James Withers and, and Gary Clark mentioned internationalisation. That's an issue that the uh, committee is, is very interested in. In fact, we've already signalled we'll be starting an inquiry uh, later in the year into internationalisation of Scottish business, uh, how we grow the export market and how, we might, uh, uh, how the Scottish Government and its agencies might assist with that. Thinking specifically about the budget, um, are there uh, any specific budget measures you would like to see that you think would assist with the helping internationalisation of Scottish business? Maybe Gary Clark, start with yourself. As I mentioned um, during my response or introductory comments, I think um, focusing in on those key business to business connections, whether that's um, support, mutual support for businesses within Scotland or whether that's connecting Scotland directly with businesses uh, overseas, making better use of both outward and inward trade missions um, and ensuring that. Uh, essentially, when you look at the figures, I mean, not enough Scottish businesses are, are exporting at the moment. Uh, and the, one of the primary reasons uh, that they give for that is they don't believe that their goods or products are, are suitable, or services uh, for that matter, are suitable for uh, the export markets. Um, we would certainly want to see more business connection within Scotland to help uh, businesses understand the full potential uh, of what they have to offer and uh, help them to make those first steps uh, into exporting because we believe there's significant untapped potential uh, within the business community in Scotland and particularly SMEs in that regard. More money towards business support and advice is what you're talking about? Um, certainly uh, it, it needs a higher priority than, than it probably has at the moment um, and 
business to business support is is in terms of what our members tell us often the best way of doing that because that's how they learn by example. Thank you. James. The key currency the key currency for um the food and drink sector in terms of exporting is confidence. So it's how can you build that confidence? We've looked at other countries that traditionally have been better than Scotland at exporting food and drink products, the likes of Ireland, New Zealand, Denmark. One of the key things they do is put what they call feet on the street, on the ground in key local markets. Uh, now, we have an SDI network across uh, 25, 27 countries around the world. Um, one of the challenges SDI have is that an individual might be based in a Tokyo office doing food and drink on a Monday, then his life sciences on Tuesday, advanced engineering on Wednesday. So we've got a lot of generalists out there. They do a great job, but we need real specialism. So the plan uh, we've developed and put in place will put dedicated food and drink specialists on the ground in those key markets. And that's what um, our competitive countries have done for a long, long time. Um, so that's absolutely critical. Then it's a case of support of companies back home. And I think... Um, Inward trade missions are really important and in some ways are as, just as valuable as the outward trade missions. But then it's really what industry needs to do for itself and that's around the collaboration agenda and getting companies to work together. And I, I certainly I couldn't speak for other sectors, but in our sector, we're starting to see a real transformation in that. The, the increased thinking about internationalisation very much changes companies' attitudes towards collaboration as well. So they cease to see the company around the corner as their competition and consider that actually it's a company... Uh, on the other side of the world. So companies working together and sharing expertise and knowledge um, is going to be critical. Any structure that can help facilitate that will be important. But for us, it's about building real specialised market knowledge on the ground in key markets and then us bringing that market knowledge back back here. Yeah. Ian McCarger. Yes, um, I didn't mention internationalisation in my opening remarks because it, that's... But we're here to discuss and I would want to endorse that that's one of our key priorities and... In terms of budget measures, anything in the business support and business growth trajectory that helps introduce companies to internationalisation principles at the earliest stage would be welcome. Also, um, measures to really create much, more, much enhanced collaboration between government and the private sector in terms of pulling our resources, our knowledge and expertise. There's a lot of great work going on. It's not communicated as effectively as it might be and if we um, collaborate even more intensely, as has happened in the food and drink sector between government and the industry, I think there could be some real benefits, tangible benefits to the economy. Thank you. OK, I'll, I'll bring in Dennis Robertson next. Can I just remind members, um, we are here to do budget scrutiny, yeah. so we can try and tie our questions as best we can towards uh, budget and, and financial issues. Okay, thank, you. Hi, thank you very much. Um, Maybe Mr. Withers first. Uh, I mean, obviously, some very impressive figures you were actually quoting at, at the very beginning in terms of the potential there uh, in terms of sustainable economic growth. And especially if we sort of focus on the export market, we've seen a slight decline uh, within the, the, the whiskey sales, for instance, recently, because there's obviously other global pressures. I mean, how, how do you think that, you know, we can, you know, um, utilise, uh, for instance, Scottish Enterprise or other factors uh, and resource that so we can actually turn around some of those other uh, aspects that impinge on a successful um, a, an ex export market in terms of uh, brand Scotland, because that's primarily what we'll be trying to move. There's, there's probably two elements to that for me, Dennis. One... Um, is around uh, spreading our risk. So the, the export figures for food and drink are fantastic and up 50-odd percent since 2007, but they mask some real challenges. So we're, the numbers are dominated by whisky, but if you look at markets and you look at food exports, 80% of our business is in Europe. Europe's had a tough time the last few years, France and Spain, so we get disproportionately hit. The whisky model is where we want to be moving to. So they have about a third of their business in Europe, a quarter in Asia, a fifth in North America, and the rest spread beautifully across the rest of the world. Um, and if you look at our food exports alone, um, half of it's accounted for by just uh, one sector, seafood. Um, so we need to sell a broader range of products in a broader range of markets. Um, now, how do we do that? It's partly about uh, a joint industry and government investment in uh, these key emerging markets. Um, but it's also about using the platform that's been created by industries like whiskey. So they have a good foothold there. Um, 
selling point is really about quality premium product, very simple ingredients with heritage and innovation. Well, actually, those um, attributes work very well across other food and drink sectors, but they also work very well across uh, tourism, across textiles. So it's developing that brand Scotland approach across a number of different uh, markets, I think, will be key. Um, We'll always take short term hits. The Chinese will decide to ban products at a whim. Um, But the key thing is making sure we don't have too many eggs in too few baskets which we have historically had so spreading that risk will be key and then learning the models of the likes of whiskey who have done that uh, very well so the analogy you use from the food and drink sector with eggs and baskets um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> eggs. yeah uh, moving to mctaggart um in terms of the the connectivity aspect i mean how do you feel that we can actually maybe try to resource some of the problems that we do have you mentioned aberdeen for instance aberdeen is a uh, a, a growth area in terms of we, we're seeing the expansion of the airport, uh, for instance. But uh, as you're probably aware, uh, as that's actually growth within the harbour area as well, which is extremely important in terms of uh, our um, export market. But uh, the the rail infrastructure, um, say from Aberdeen, uh, to enable some of those uh, other other uh, opportunities is 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 quite. Um, Awful. Um, so, how do you, do you do you envisage that maybe the budget would be looking to try and resource in uh, those areas, those challenges, to create more opportunities? I think it's certainly challenging when there are so many calls on the budget. But I think um, probably what we need to do is try to find consensus about the the key priorities for Scotland's economy, um, and be able to accelerate some of the projects that we all know and have accepted are important to developing the economy. So the sort of higher speed links and better um, rolling stock um, that any commuters going up to Aberdeen will be aware of is, is something that it would be good if the budget could address how we accelerate providing and delivering some of these outcomes. Um, as I, I do accept that it's not easy when there are competing demands up to the Highlands as well, for example, and to the, the southwest and the borders. But I think we have to accept that that connectivity issue is a major issue for business in many parts of Scotland. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, but you know, you, you mentioned rolling stock, but isn't it the infrastructure that's the problem? It is. That that that's the thing that we should focus on initially. That will help deliver the access. Um, the other factors come after that. Yeah. yeah okay, that's fine. Um, the, the, the challenges for the food and drink sector, uh, Mr Weathers going back again, um, uh, we've got a Team Scotland brand and obviously we're looking at exports, but obviously in the domestic market, how do we, how do we support uh, and bring people into that sector when there are other um, opportunities out there? Uh, you know, if I was looking in the North East, for instance, the opportunities for people working in the energy sector is, is far greater uh, and then maybe going into the food and drink sector. Um, because of the wage structure, etc., and, and I'm sure Mr. Boyd might want to, to, to come in here at some point in terms of opportunities for, for people within that, even the hospitality sector, you know, with the, with the, the low wages. I mean, how do we address that? Um, I think it is a, it's definitely, it's absolutely a challenge. So, you know, there's the old phrase a teacher of mine once used, which is "work hard, or else you'll end up in that food factory around the corner." Um, and there's a bit of a perception around the food and drinks not one of your destination. Unless you own it, that tends to help. Um, You know, it's not a destination of first choice. So I think you need to look at why is that the case. Um, I think the... The reality is, like many industry, the food industry needs world-class logistics experts, sustainability experts. We need Mandarin translators, um, high-level IT folk, as well as important production line jobs as well. Part of it is an issue the industry itself needs to address about um, getting perception about the sector being one of Scotland's best performing sectors and one that always does very well in difficult times, uh, let alone in um, a growing economy. Um, and part of it is about training. You know, we've not, if we've been honest about it, we've not had a good enough culture in the food and drink industry in investing in training and skills. So that's starting to change now. There's a new National Skills Academy that's been set up to encourage companies to think hard about training and skills. And in a tough year, you know, the first thing you cut is not the training budget and the marketing budget. Actually, it's the very thing you need to be investing in. So there's now a skills academy set up to help companies access the right training and also to get training providers to um, tweak and change their offer to make sure it's fit for food and drink. So um, I'm seeing, 
you know, an increased interest in the food and drink industry. Is it where we want it to be? No, but I think the culture is starting to, starting to change. And it helps if the industry is successful, which it is at the moment. We don't necessarily need to put in money, though, do we, in terms of some of the resources to raise the awareness and opportunities? Because so, surely we, we, we go one step further back and we take it to the, to the schools and provide the opportunities uh, there um, and raise that awareness for people to move perhaps into food and drink, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. No, I would completely agree. And there's a lot of good work that goes on. Um, I think, you know, part of the new curriculum has food much more embedded into into day to day um, learning than ever was before. And there's a number of different projects from seafood in schools, chefs in schools program, uh, Food and Drink Federation run uh, a Tasty Careers program. So there's quite a lot of that work happening in schools. Um, and you're right, that doesn't take a huge amount. It doesn't take a slug of public sector funding. What it takes more and more of is the various industry body and public sector bodies that work in this area to work cohesively together and I think we've started to uh, create that now. I wonder if Mr Boy wants to comment in terms of you know how we, we, we engage some of our younger people into maybe some of the less attractive sectors but I mean I guess some of these less attractive sectors um, are the less least well paid as well. Yeah well I mean you've mentioned two sectors hospitality and food and drink I mean I think in hospitality it's just very difficult to be honest I mean I think you have a sector there that's been operating for decades in a low skill, low wage, low productivity, low progression equilibrium. You know, now how you break out of that is very difficult. I think in the first instance it's more about where you set the regulatory floor in terms of wages. I think in the longer term certainly it would be incumbent on me as a trade unionist to say if we can extend collective bargaining within that sector. I think not just wages will improve but I think the quality of work, I think opportunities for progression, training opportunities would expand also. I think uh, food and drinks altogether more you know, different and interesting. I think you'd have to recognise that some elements of the sector, the employment is first class. I mean, you look at the whisky industry, I mean, there's been really interesting history of industrial relations in the whisky industry and going back 15 years or so, you know, a real move towards partnership approaches in the sector. And that's not just in distilling. I mean, some of the most interesting uh, developments happened in those lower paid, lower skill parts of the sector. If you look at Diageo's bottling plants, for instance, that work looked as if it was heading to other parts of the Diageo supply chain abroad. But the unions and management worked very closely together, completely overhauled the way these plants were managed, the way people worked and derived massive benefits to productivity in the process and retained jobs in Scotland that people thought 20 years ago were, were no longer going to be here. Uh, I mean, I think, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, how do we kind of move to extend that practice into other parts of food and drink, I think is, you know, a, a major challenge for us all. I think you'd have to recognise, you know, particularly, you know, large parts of food production and food process and the supply chain pressures that are there and, you know, the purchasing power of the supermarkets and their ability to drive a whole model that's based around point value in the supermarket and therefore dri driving out of the supply chain a lot of the capacity to um, invest in skills and reproduce those skills that the sector needs moving forward. I think that requires, a, you know, frankly, a different approach to economic development in these sectors and one that will probably take a, a whole session of the committee to discuss, I think, in detail. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mike McKenzie, I think, has a supplementary. Uh, yes, uh, and it was to uh, Mr Ruthers, um, uh, and, and, and it was specifically about food and drink, um, that you, you, you'd mentioned the difficulties because of the EU economic difficulties, um, and and yet you know the seafood sector is doing fairly well. But I think if you take the farm salmon statistics out of that, the rest of that sector is perhaps not doing quite as well as you might imagine. And I'm particularly concerned, for instance, about the shellfish sector mm -hmm. um, and the fact that a lot of that sector stems from pretty small businesses. We know again that a lot of our, most of our exporting um, is as a result of the activities of a few big businesses. Um, the, sh the, the shellfish sector very often is, is, is characterised by smaller businesses um, who are primarily exporting to France and Spain. And I wonder if you think there's anything that we could do uh, you know, to help overcome that problem. Um, yeah, I do, and I think that's where the collaborative piece comes in. So the, that SME structure, um, you know, is similar in food and drink as, as across most Scottish businesses. So 80% of 
food and drink businesses in Scotland employ less than 10 people. So we are a nation of very, very small businesses. Um, and you're right, if you look at farm salmon production that's worth about £300 million in export, uh, there's really only eight or so companies uh, in that. Um, whereas inshore fisheries, shellfish and others are much more fragmented. Um, so it's about collaborative approaches. Where can you get a cluster of companies working together to get into export markets? Uh, and we've seen that working well in other sectors. There's a craft brewers group now, there's a craft distillers group. Our rapeseed oil producers have come together as a group to collectively do work, collectively invest in export salespeople supported by the public sector. Um, and that's where that collaboration piece will be critical. Um, and, you know, there are real opportunities. The, the Tokyo Seafood Show was just a few weeks ago. Shellfish representatives there as well, uh, looking at getting into that market. The one advantage that um, smaller companies have with export markets is for a lot of international buyers, small is beautiful. It's a great provenance story. They're interested in the family connections. It's not mass market. It's not uh, mass brand. It's got a real provenance story. So whilst their routes to market are challenging um, and will need to be overcome with really smart collaboration, um, their opportunity to derive a premium in the marketplace will be greater actually than some of the bigger brands. I mean, I absolutely agree with you about uh, collaboration has been the way forward. I think one of the difficulties you find on the ground, though, is that those small businesses are, in, you, you know, they compete with each other quite aggressively. And, you know, how how do you promote that collaboration that's necessary to get out to these foreign markets um, in businesses that, that are so inherently competitive? Yeah. So my, my quick answer to that is... You use examples where it's worked well. So if we take salmon and ignoring the scale of the companies there, uh, if you say there's eight or nine big salmon farming companies in Scotland, fiercely competitive with each other, but they will collectively invest in getting into the market. They will collectively invest in raising awareness of Scottish salmon in the Chinese market, creates interest from buyers. After that, they will compete fiercely for those contracts, but they will work collectively in developing a brand around Scottish salmon. The whisky industry have been smart in doing that as well. They have a whisky association that helps them get into individual markets, it protects the regulations. Thereafter, the individual companies and businesses will compete, but they could, there's an area where they can work collectively. And in reality, if you're a shellfish producer in Scotland, your competition isn't the guy down the road, it is the guy on the other side of the world. And what our experience would be that the more companies get into international markets and start thinking internationally, the more they re-evaluate re who the competition is. Yeah, uh, uh, Come and shoot one. Very quickly, if you don't mind, and I think it's, it's just important, I think, to stress that all around the world, companies in fierce competition with each, each other manage to collaborate on the kind of issues that James has just described. I mean, your classic examples would be the Italian textiles and ceramic sectors, you know, fierce competition, but also you know, very, very close collaboration where they have a mutual interest. So I think we've too often, across the UK, actually pursued a very particular competitive model, which kind of tends to look with scorn and collaboration. You know, I think we have to broaden our horizons and recognise that this is the way forward. I think the point I would make, um, and I'm, you know, I'm very interested to hear feedback on that, is that the examples you used of good examples of collaboration, whisky industry, big companies, you know, salmon farming, big companies. The particular problem is seems to be, you know, uh, amongst the smaller companies uh, in in the shellfish sector, for instance, who. Uh, um, and maybe it's a feature of small businesses that the same guy that's, you know, um, competing aggressively is also the guy in, within the structure of a small business who's um, expected to collaborate, whereas perhaps there's a separation of the roles within bigger business. I don't know, but um, I, just, I think there's low-hanging fruit, fruit for us to pick here if we can solve those okay. problems. Can I make an observation? That is, well, this is a very interesting discussion. Uh, we are here to do budget scrutiny, and I, I'm, I'm slightly nervous that we're wandering a little bit off that topic, but I'll let Mother Withers respond. Yeah, if you just allow me one time, I was going to <laughs> wind this, <laughs> wind this <laughs> back <laughs> out to <laughs> specific <laughs> budget lines. You'll be telling us to do a wonderful job next <laughs> 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 Advise the point I was going to make and try and make it sound as though it's connected to a budget discussion. Um, there is investment going in. So there's a, there's a particular project called Market Driven Supply Chains, a £1.6 million project funded by Scottish Enterprise and Scottish Government, which is about creating those new collaborative networks. Um, and there are good examples where small companies are working together. Now, often to get over the competitive tension, you don't do it within, say, the shellfish sector. If you take Aaron as an example, they have a brand called Taste of Aaron. They've brought 12 producers on that island together brewery, whiskey, jam 
jams, chutneys, oat cakes, cheeses, um, and they're now filling a container together because they couldn't fill a container individually on their own and it would be very expensive. And those products are being served in the five-star hotels in Dubai. So some of that uh, collaboration is about cross-sectoral stuff because it's going to take a while to get over the fact that two shellfish guys are going to think they're competing with each other. So let's take shellfish with a craft beer, with um, artisan cheese, and do that um, collective stuff. And that's where the public sector can help because um, the catalyst for collaboration often needs to be an honest broker someone that doesn't have a vested interest coming from one of those particular companies. And that's where funding into things like this market-driven supply chain project, which brings someone in to be the catalyst to bring them together, after that they walk, and those companies have recognised the value of that collaboration. And that can be a really useful uh, channel of investment. That's a great insight. I'm very grateful to you for that. OK, uh, Richard Baker. Uh, thank you, convener. Like uh, Dennis Robertson, can I warmly welcome uh, Mr McTaggart's comments about the importance of connectivity to Aberdeen in, in, com in terms of the, the coming budget. I imagine that reflects the importance of the oil and gas sector, which is obviously still um, performing very strongly. Um, now, that's an area where we're talking about skills area. There are identified skills gaps by the industry, but I think there's more potential for people to find work if they're given the right skills. There was some debate earlier on in terms of whether that needs additional public sector funding, but of course the whole issue of skills investment has been quite... Uh, the debate around has been quite keen over, for example, for their education budgets and in previous um, budget processes. I mean, do you think that there isn't a strong case, in fact, uh, for additional priority to be given in the coming budget for investment in skills and training? I think perhaps some measure of investment, and again, again getting back to the issues of collaboration, r raising the visibility of good practice that's already happening, some of the collaborative measures that are underway to address skills pro um, problems in particular industries, um, is something that would be worthwhile. Um, as I say, I think there is a lot of investment already underway. There's a lot of good practice going on. Not enough people know about it, so perhaps some of the effort should be directed towards really raising communication and visibility of good work so that other industries can consider how they can apply similar measures. Um, I highlighted the success of the um, oil and gas industry, which is very strong in terms of exports as well, as well as the food and drink, obviously, as Mr Withers was mentioning earlier. Um, but in terms of the... You know, our success in exports seems to quite focused on those two areas, and it's not as strong, it seems to me, across the economy as a whole. And my next question is really specifically for, um, or in the first instance for Mr Boyd, because in terms of manufactur manufacturing exports, those have declined in recent years. I mean, do you think there's anything in terms of Scottish government policy or indeed in terms of the coming budget decisions where the Scottish government could do more to promote the manufacturing um, sector in particular, and also have an aspiration from greater uh, for, for you know to reverse that decline that we've seen in terms of exports from our manufacturing sector. Okay. I think when you're trying to assess the success of Scotland in manufactured exports, I think the Scottish government, the Scottish budget, and where it's spent is not a not one of the primary factors. I think we'd have to be clear about that. I mean, I think there's a huge element of path dependence here. I mean, we are not, for decisions going back decades, we are not now making the stuff that the rest of the world wants to buy, particularly those emerging markets. Now, you could argue all day why that's the case and who's to blame for that, but that's where we are at this moment in time. I think there's been particular problems over the last few years, as James, I think it was earlier on mentioned, the Eurozone is a hugely important export market. It's been very weak, so that has damaged... Scotland's businesses uh, or Scotland's export potential uh, and I think we, we have to be clear that even if we did more of what we're already doing, I would argue there's a lot of successful activity already happening regarding supporting Scotland's manu manufactured exports even if we did everything that I'd want the Scottish Government to do, as we say in the written submission success might well be that you maintain manufactured exports at their current levels you know and you look at what's uh, happening around the world, you look at great uncertainty in some of our very key markets, you know, you look at great uncertainty in some of the big emerging markets, you look, as I say, at what we are currently making, you look at what the most successful countries in terms of exporting are making at this moment in time, and Germany's been very clever, again, for you know reasons going back decades, that it's now making the machine tools that China is using to build its economy, and that's why it's been so successful in that market. But Germany's also benefiting from what is, in effect, a 
de facto massively undervalued currency, you know, and things like the sterling exchange rate regime is going to have a far greater bearing in Scottish manufactured exports than Scottish government policy. But to end on a you know a, a positive note, I mean, over the last few months, sitting at various industry leadership groups at various conferences, you hear time and time again excellent examples of Scottish businesses that have received first class support from Scottish enterprise and SDI and grown their manufactured um, product uh, manufactured exports exponentially. So I've been I guess the, the temptation here is always to be looking for new and different things that we can be doing. Maybe we just need to be embedding those, you know, the good stuff we're already doing and making sure that that's properly funded consistently going forward. Okay. Marco Bergi. Yes. Uh, to go back to an earlier topic uh, that Mr McTaggart raised, actually, I wanted to, to follow up on it. That was the nature of research and development and how we can expand that for the, the needs of the Scottish economy. You said that that would be a, one of your three areas that you, that you picked out. I was just wondering if you could perhaps outline what sort of policy instruments you'd like to see in the budget that would bring about that kind of objective of expanding uh, commercial research and development in Scotland. Well, I know that um, a number of the universities in Scotland are doing excellent work themselves in terms of innovation hubs and clusters of innovation. And I think that's maybe the kind of area where um, budget resources could be supplementing um, what's going on within the university sector. Um, again, it's coalescing around things that are happening, perhaps, but um, being a catalyst to supporting the longer-term aspirations of some of that work that's ongoing. And why do you think... This is perhaps going into the bigger question uh, territory, but why do you think there has been that underperformance and <coughs> is it reasonable to expect Scottish budgets to be able to address that in, in a near time horizon? I don't know if it's reasonable to expect because it has been a... I think there's been a cultural dimension to it. Um, our views on innovation um, are perhaps quite late in the day in terms of international competitiveness, but nevertheless we know that we have um, the knowledge and the expertise to really deliver leading-edge technology, leading-edge manufactured products to the world if we can get it right. Um, so I don't think we can say that the budget um, principles would be able to resolve all of the expectations around that, but in terms of being supportive and being a catalyst to further work in that sphere in the R&D realm, I think that's where it could be useful. Do other panellists have a view on research and development support in the budget? No. Well, in that case, can I just ask one further question then on an aspect of research and development and sort of the export of research and development. It's, it's all very well to talk about supporting the universities to... Uh, spin off commercially and a lot of universities are doing that and a lot of work's been done on that over the last decade and more. Scotland's companies have a lot of expertise in uh, key areas, oil and gas being one in particular, and yet our figures for commercial research and development are not <coughs> very high. They're amongst the lowest in the OECD. Is there a problem, therefore, with us almost exporting our expertise, winning research contracts abroad, and is that something as separate from what's happening with universities that we could help through budget measures? Um, I don't really know the evidence that would support that kind of fragmentation that all our research expertise is being exported abroad. But um, no, what I mean is our, our companies that have expertise yeah. are why aren't they winning research contracts from abroad, for example? Because we know that we know from the, the business expenditure research and development statistics that, that Scotland is not winning commercial research. And uh, I assume there's only so much that can be done within Scotland and based on our own market. Uh, why, why is there not an export of, of that through, through the winning of contracts abroad? And can we do anything about it? Or is that not an interpretation you accept? I think there may be an element in it in terms of the, um, the actual export figures for services from Scotland. That's obviously something that's being looked at in more detail year by year. And obviously the higher education sector um, is one of the leading 
export sectors in terms of services. So I think we have to look at where R&D sits within those kind of figures, the, the kind of deline delineation of figures in the export figures. Um, it would certainly be something that would be, I'm sure, worthwhile pursuing. Mm -hmm. To try and answer that question, I might go back to your previous one, but I mean, I think again we're fundament fundamentally back to an issue of industrial structure. I mean, we're not strong in R&D intensive sectors, and I think that you know, simple truth isn't acknowledged often enough. I think we also take a much too narrow definition of innovation. I think that's changing, thankfully, but I think you know some of the things I was discussing earlier on regarding innovative working practices, which have you know produced huge dividends in terms of productivity, having you know generally been discussed as something very different from you know, core R&D. Well, actually, it's all very important innovation. It will help companies to become more competitive. Uh, more competitive. I think we also have to recognise that the financial structure in, across the UK actually is not kind to innovative companies. And we know through research that innovation is penalised by banks when I mean, they're lending to firms the same as being riskier, understandably, and yet you know, they pay a significant penalty because of that. So, you know, when you're faced with that picture, where is the Scottish budget best spent? Is it best spent in trying to increase commercial R&D, or should the focus just be on sustaining public R&D or increasing public R&D, you know, whilst working very hard to make sure that this can be spun out as successfully as possible? I mean, I think, you know, you, know, you look at where the most innovative economies, um, you know, what are their innovation systems like? You know, and we, we tend to look at the United States as a model of kind of, you know, the success of venture capitalism, etc. You know, but I mean, all the enabling technologies in Apple iPhone were originally publicly funded. The Google algorithm was originally publicly funded. You know, so we have to recognise and not be bashful or think about the, very, you know, the crucial importance of publicly supported R&D. So, is your view then that if we continue to fund public R&D, then commercial will follow? Well, that would be the aspiration. I don't think we should be complacent that it would mm. necessarily follow. I think you have to be working very hard to, to make sure that the system as a whole, public and private, is working in tandem to make sure that ultimately we gain the, the commercial success. Okay. Thank you. Just to add um, uh, a couple of things to that. One, I think your question around how do we consider our R&D knowledge and our capability as an export opportunity, um, and I think that's much more back to, I think the question was from Dennis earlier about Brand Scotland, so um, you've got individual sectors working really hard to try and get a coherent view of what the export opportunity is. We've tried to do it in food and drink, tourism are doing it now. The next step is doing that cross-sectorally. So actually, if you looked at uh, export strategy for life sciences, textiles, tourism, food and drink, you're going to find they're very, very similar. So wedding that together is going to be part of it. So when we're going on a trade mission, actually, it's not a food and drink trade mission, it's a Scottish trade mission with companies that have an opportunity there. I think on your, the, back to your, the original point um, you were asking Ian about, um, in terms of um, you know, what, what does the future of R&D look like from, from an industry perspective? I think one comment in principle and then two budget related. One is we still need to keep working on universities redefining what success is. So, uh, you know, very simplistically, success to me as an industry body is not a university getting an article published in an obscure management journal somewhere. It's actually translation of knowledge into business impact. And I think there needs to be much more weight put on funding for universities and academic institutions around business impact. I think that's definitely improving, but I think there's more to be done uh, there. Two budget things. Um, investments in bridging the gap between business and universities. So if we just, again, too simplistic, but if we recognise the fact that often academics and businesses talk a different language uh, and just accept they too often talk a different language, how do you bridge the gap between them? Um, and, you know, it's not, it's too simplistic, it's not always the case, but it is an issue still. So investments in things like interface, which act as a translation service effectively between universities who have solutions and businesses that never thought to ask academia for a solution uh, and can translate how that solution is applicable to them. Um, and the second thing, I think we maybe need to think more carefully around um, investment in universities and the decision making process on that. So the Scottish Funding Council ran a process recently, put ten million pounds on the table for the creation of innovation centres. And you know, I think three fantastic proposals are going forward. Part of the challenge was the only way that money can be rooted 
and the decision taken is through universities. So they wanted it to be industry-led. The reality was, at its worst, a lot of industries went into a room somewhere, decided what they wanted to do, and then the week before the deadline phoned industry to get them signed up to what they wanted to do. How could you change that, actually give industry and maybe bodies like these greater say on the decision-making? of where that money goes. So actually industry could take a view as to whether this will really be relevant investment of money from an industry perspective. You wouldn't want it totally industry-led because often industry doesn't know what it doesn't know. So you need the research expertise there, but something that can help change part of that guidance of where funding goes towards universities and what we spend our money on might make things a bit better. Uh, Chick Brody. Um, First comment, Mr. Withers, about <coughs> teaching Mandarin. I just say, watch this space. Um, but before we beat ourselves up, intriguing. yeah, <laughs> wait, <laughs> you, you're, uh, the intrigue will be solved shortly. Um, in 2.9, in Scotland, uh, in two years ago, a trade surplus of 2.9 billion. Got to watch we don't start beating ourselves up that everything's terrible. Uh, I won't comment on the deficit of the rest of the UK because we're past that at this stage. Um, I just wonder if I can link two questions to Ian McTaggart and James Withers. Um, connectivity in terms of uh, and, and fast exports in terms of how that impacts our the company cash flows uh, and you know, costs, etc. We had a situation, I had a situation recently with, you know, when we had the macro crisis, Russia. And the opportunity to export to China, uh, flying, I have to say, out of Prestwick. Um, but the view of the, those that know better in exports in that particular industry suggested, oh, no, that's not the way we do it. We'll put it in containers and we'll ship it down to, to wherever. And it'll take X number of weeks or days, much greater than, than if we you know, flew them out and refrigerated to, to, to China. The market was there. Do we, do we believe that we're doing enough and can we do anything in, within the budget scope to generate uh, an even greater incentive <coughs> for uh, companies to be a bit more flexible and organisations to be a bit more flexible in terms of really addressing the rapid movement between various geographic markets for a particular product? Um. I suppose the quick answer is yes. I think connectivity remains hugely important. So, you know, a direct link between Scotland and Asia for freight would be a big step forward. And there's a number of operators looking around that, but the economics are really challenging. At the moment, one of the best things that's happened in terms of uh, exports of product to Asia and the Middle East has been the Emirates connection from Glasgow. So if any of you have been on that flight from uh, Glasgow to Dubai, you're almost certainly sitting on top of an awful lot of uh, seafood that's sitting in the hull, uh, going out on you know at least two, three times a week. Um, but going through Dubai still adds hours, and a direct connection to Hong Kong would potentially be useful. One of the challenges with products is ambient versus refrigerated versus chilled, and also weight. So if you're trying to get beer out to Asia, it's going to be difficult to do on a flight because of the weight. You're going to still better shipping that uh, and it's about shelf life as well um, so I think there's more we can do if, if your challenge is around is more we can do around connectivity but also being fleet of foot to take opportunities I think then um, the answer is yes I think the macro situation was um, a difficult one for everyone to get their head around very quickly because it was suddenly closed and then looking for new outlets um, for 25 million pounds worth of product very very quickly um, and we maybe don't have the suite of options on the table in Scotland that we could do with in future Yes, I think, as James says, it's dealing with the economics of it. Um, there have been um, attempts in the past, I think particularly in the food and drink sector, where there are um, opportunities for um, increasing volumes, getting scale, which would bring the economics back into the picture. So trying to get clusters of companies who are perhaps approaching the same markets to collaborate um, and to be able to ship higher volumes at a more cost-effective price and, and be saving money for the companies involved. Um, it is a challenge, though. There are Sorry to interrupt, Ian, but yeah. can I just ask, on that basis, do you believe the government economic agencies are doing enough uh, to support that consolidation uh, uh, and attacking various marketplaces based on that and, and shipping more directly out of Scotland? 
I'm, to be honest, I'm not aware of a great amount of activity led by government agencies actually doing that. I don't know if they see that as one of their priorities or whether the industry should be doing it themselves. I'm not aware of any specific uh, issues in terms of uh, government support in that regard, but um, I think you're right to highlight the challenges that, uh, that exist in terms of trying to get goods uh, to market and the importance of, of connectivity more generally. Um, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, if we're going to get more businesses exporting in Scotland, I think there's, there's a number of approaches. I mean, there's the personal approach to getting down uh, businesses dealing with businesses, um, either collaboratively within Scotland or, uh, or internationally, and ensuring that they've got the right links in place to allow them to get, to get goods to market. Um, and there are issues over um, uh, air transport in terms of freight relocation of um, containers, etc., um, all of which uh, present challenges um, in terms of whether government can do something about it in terms of the budget. Um, it, it, it could probably be afforded the higher priority, but I don't know what specific measures would necessarily need to happen in the case of this year's budget to allow that to, to take place. It, it was instructive that we got, I think, 42 minutes into this session uh, before currency was mentioned. Uh, and obviously that has an effect, but... Um, it just, I wonder asking Stephen the point about Germany. Germany's export success, and it's not just down to currency, is that they have what they call the Mittelschnatt, which focuses on uh, companies are encouraged by the government to focus on one product and spread across as many markets as it can. Is there anything that you think the government might do in the budget to encourage that type of activity for if small, small exporters, for example? where the focus is, not, uh, is looking much more geographically as opposed to a uh, product and product diversity. Yeah, I mean, we've been discussing the middle start with the First Minister and Mr Swinney for a number of years now. Uh, I mean, I think we've looked at a range of issues that German companies tend to do better than Scottish, uh, their Scottish counterparts. The way the German system, in terms of the priority that German firms give to working with the range of their stakeholders and the relationship between the firm and their, their funders. I think it's just all so different from what you have over here. Clearly the priority placed on the educational skills training as well, absolutely fundamental to the, the productivity success of German firms. But I mean I think you I mean you have to I mean I think the you know the exchange rate is very, very important. I mean the Euro has been massive uh, for Germany. And I think you also have to cross off a number of issues that fundamentally are attributable to German cultures that we're never going to replicate here. Frank, we've been trying for an awful long time in relation to in relation particularly to vocational skills training. I mean, when were the first initiatives under the early Tony Blair governments trying to replicate the German vocational skills system? They were all disastrous because fundamentally Fundamentally, German employers feel an obligation to train young people in the way that Scottish employers don't. So whilst I think it's extremely important that we look you know, at Germany and other nations to see what we can learn from them, I'm kind of sceptical about you know, the prospects for developing a, Scotland, a Scottish middle stand in the near future. In terms of the Scottish budget, I'm, I find it very difficult to put my finger on specific funding mechanisms that will you know, help quicken that journey towards the middle stand. I think most of what we already should be doing, we are doing, and I think we're doing it reasonably well. I think a lot of the work that's taking place under the industry leadership groups, within you know, James in, in food and drink, but also other sectors, is helping uh, establish that kind of collaboration, helping improve uh, relationships between uh, different stakeholders. But it's necessarily long-term work here. You know, and I think it's very important, and I think it's very important that we stick to it. Where it needs funded by government, I think it's important it's funded. But I mean, I think we have to be realistic about you know moving towards a German model anytime soon. One last question. Yeah. Uh, we, we had a round table recently talking about social enterprises, which are quite uh, critical, I think, as far as the economy is concerned. And there's disparate uh, means of funding these. I wonder if you have any, if you, given the rapid growth of social enterprises, and not just in the internal market. I mean, there are some of them that are now uh, exporting knowledge, for example. Uh, if you have any comment as to how the budget might address the uh, growth and the potential of that particular sector. 
Thank you, Stephen. Sorry. Again, I find it, I find it difficult to answer that general point. I mean, we've got a huge variety of social enterprises out there. I mean, I think my, my approach would essentially be they should be supported in pretty much the same basis as private firms should. I mean, if there's going to be, a, you know, ultimately a payback to Scottish society or the economy, then, you know, they should be funded to do what they're trying to do, that, that, you know, they're not going to be able to fund themselves. But, I mean, I think trying to identify general mechanisms for all social enterprises is just tremendously difficult. Thank you. Can I um, ask a follow-up question, um, not in relation to that, but the previous question? Um, I'm going to start off with Gary Clark, actually, on this, because... We hear a lot from the enterprise agencies when we take evidence from them about their support for account managed companies. You think there's, is, is enough being done to support other enterprises who are not account managed? Um, I, I think there's more that could be done um, in terms of focusing in on these businesses. I mean, obviously, chambers of commerce across Scotland are directly supporting businesses in a number of ways, um, partly with, with, with government support. For example, Business Mentoring Scotland um, has engaged with, with over 8,000 businesses across Scotland to uh, assist them in um, taking their business forward, growing their business. Um, and I think you know last year's results, for example, we achieved um, a GVA increase of about somewhere between about £30 million pounds, um, for those businesses. And that was about just under a 1,000 businesses last year. So that's a successful model that is assisting individual businesses. Um, it's also a model that's assisting a wide range of businesses because it is touching upon social enterprises that uh, that Chick has mentioned. And uh, it's it's not restricted to any particular type of business. It's very wide ranging. In fact, I, mean, I was speaking to, to one business fairly recently. Um, it was a chap from Dumfries, a uh, farmer who had invented this uh, attachment for the top of a ladder, uh, which held a can of paint. Um, he thought this was great, you know, put the idea around a few friends. He came to business mentoring. Um, he got a mentor. The mentor put in touch, put him in touch with someone that very day, um, with experience in internationalisation of a product. He's now exporting to Australia. So it, it, it's it's a system that works, and I think that system reaches a huge number of businesses. Um, certainly, eight thousand businesses that we've engaged with through that one mentoring arm alone. And uh, I think there's there's room for that in the marketplace, and there's actual room for that to extend in the marketplace. We would certainly argue because there's clearly demand for it. And it is about businesses helping other businesses. Yeah. That's something that you're doing as, as the Chamber, so you know, thinking about the budget, is, is there, is there a, a gap there that's not currently being filled? Well, that's, that, that, that project is supported by the budget through um, uh, Scottish Enterprise. So clearly, if we had more resources to be able to provide that free mentoring at the point of service uh, across the country, then we would be able to uh, engage more businesses in that. OK, thanks. Stephen? Yeah, I mean, I think we really need to be careful to kill the notion that the networks engage with account managed companies and they don't engage with anybody else because there's too many people out there, frankly, believe that's the case. I mean, just last week I was at the Highland Economic Forum and Ty were presenting on the work they've been doing to engage small businesses around about social media. You know, fantastic work had been taking place. I understand it started in kind of Cairngorms National Park, but spread out to all parts of the, the Highlands and Islands helping companies, obviously given their geographical location, being able to use social media uh, well is tremendously important to them. And this work had been taking place, I think, about 100 seminars last year, a huge variety of very small businesses, and that work is really important. But I think it's also really important to stress that Scotland has a very long tail of very, very small companies who lack, frankly, the capacity or the ambition to grow. Now, it just wouldn't be appropriate for the networks to be spending time with these companies in the way that they do with account management firms and I think if we all could accept these kind of simple truths I think the debate about the networks what they do and how they might improve because of course they can improve what they do I think it would be a much more mature and a much more effective discussion. Okay. James. Um, just two points I would add to that one um, is around how we define who and what should be account managed 
So I think you can have a framework around growth aspirations, turnover and all of them, which, which makes sense. But some of the real growth potential will come from part of that long tail that Stephen talks about through, again, sorry to sound like a start record, collaboration. So actually you're going to have a group of companies together who collectively can have a shared ambition with shared potential growth. We should think about how we can account manage that kind of collective as well as individual companies. Um, and I think the... Um, Second part is ensuring that companies that are account managed, that those that are, um, and this is a responsibility that doesn't just sit with the enterprise agencies, but with all supporting organisations, the, the four of us here, um, academic institutes, make sure those account managed companies have a good broad view of support that's available. Because there's a great support that can be delivered through Scottish Enterprise, but there's a world of support that exists that is not delivered through them. And so if account, ma com account managers are often the, the front face between the public sector and individual companies with growth aspirations having that broad view of the wider spectrum of support that exists beyond that just to look through enterprise companies would be important as well Thank you. Thank you. Can I just yeah. briefly what's your view of the account managers that the inverted commas consultants that advise these companies I mean how they, they you know the, the, the high the, the people who manage the the major account the account managers yeah. generally have not mentors, but consultants and advisors. How well, I mean, do you think they're qualified? No, I mean, don't individually qualified, but the qualification process is sufficient to ensure that, you know, we talked about exports, and it's quite an expenditure, which again comes back to the budget uh, on that resource. Uh, do you think they're geared? I mean, it's a general question, and if you can't answer it, don't. But is it, uh, do you think that these people who are leading the charge are sufficiently aware, for example, of, of export markets in particular? Um, I think my short answer is yes. I think there is an issue about the use of consultants sometimes. And I think where you might have a framework of consultants that could be drawn down by an enterprise agency to plug into a business, sometimes the decision on which consultant to use can still be driven by price rather than uh, quality. Um, I don't think that is a fundamental flaw in the system, but I've seen examples where that has been the case before. But generally, I think the account managed system, and there's, you know, take food and drink, there's 200 account managed companies roughly. There are 20 now dedicated, roughly, de well, just about dedicated solely to food and drink account managers, which helps then the, the understanding of that sector from that account manager um, is a really good framework. I think the long tail stuff, some of them, as Stephen says, is, is a lack of ambition, lack of growth. Well, we'll leave them be. Um, but where industry, I think industry bodies have to step up to the mark is helping support some of that long tail, who ultimately are the pipeline for future account managed companies. But I think, I think the structure is pretty good. I do think there can be an issue around consultants, though. Uh, yeah, it's very briefly. It was just a, um, it was a couple of points. I think Mr. Clark and uh, Mr. McTaggart made. They, 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 you've used the, the 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 phrase challenge. I think you know a few times now. I'm just wondering: is that challenge the opportunity um, to to try uh, and look at ways that we approach those challenges? For instance, in the connectivity. I mean, if we try and re repair some of the aspects within the connectivity, then you're you're creating jobs. I mean, do you see us using the the budget framework? to try and uh, address some of those challenges that you were, you were mentioning as opportunities to drive, obviously, the economy forward? Yeah, I mean, for, for, for every challenge, the, there is an opportunity. But um, you didn't say so. I mean, this is my <laughs> point. This is my point. You know, we just held the challenges. No, well, I mean, I, for example, I mean, in terms of connectivity, um, you know, one issue which, which has been raised by, uh, with us by the, the network is, um, you know, very an issue over, over recent weeks, um, the, the, the A9 um, north of Inverness, particularly Berrydale Braes, which Scottish Government have a plan in place to address over a number of years, um, but is one of the key connecting factors to a very important part of our country and our economy. And there's an opportunity in addressing that um, to really make the most of what Caithness has to offer because it has all the necessary bits in place. It's got some very good businesses, large and small, uh, operating internationally in that part of the world. It's got um, it's part of the trunk road network. It's got an airport. It's got ports. Um, it's got a rail net, uh, rail connection, but each of these are extremely fragile, um, and the road network especially so. 
uh, and if we're to support the, the growth in that area that, that is happening and, and has the potential to, to, to go further, then yes, there's an opportunity. If we address you know, that one small piece of road, which would probably cost less than £10 million, you could open up economic opportunity in that whole you know, corner of Scotland. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes, there are opportunities. What Gary says, um, the opportunities are there. There are um, conflicting pressures on budgets, obviously, but would say that the operating environment that any business finds itself in can enhance or detract from those opportunities that it has as a business. So those kind of infrastructural issues will, to some extent, dictate how competitive um, the companies can be in the in the geography that they find themselves in. Right, thank you. Um, Joan McCartan. Thank you very much. Just to continue on that theme, um, I think the focus, the focus on growth to generate more growth can also be applied geographically in terms of the way that money is spent via the budget. I'm a South of Scotland MSP and I, uh, I'm based in the South West, which um, it's not a high growth area compared to some of the other areas we've discussed today, like the North East. So if your strategy is based on uh, investing in growth, what happens to parts of the country um, like the part that I'm based in, um, which are not high growth at the moment? For example, you could, you could improve the infrastructural links to the South West. Um, you, you would be doing that in the hope that it would generate new growth in the future. Um, do you see that as a, as a difficulty in the way things are structured at the moment? I think that any, um, any budget, and particularly any um, uh, transport budget looking at connectivity across the country has, um, uh, you know, it, it, it is clearly geared at delivering the, the biggest bang for the buck. Um, that said, I think there has been uh, a very strong focus in recent years about filling in the, the gaps in the central Scotland networks, whether that's electrification of the rail system or um, completion of the M8, M80, M74, etc., uh, which are really essential to making Scotland tick. Um, but I think the focus has to move on to uh, the more regional uh, aspects, and you know, Aberdeen's already been men mentioned. I mean, it is an economic hub, and yet, in terms of the rail network, you've got single track lines connecting it to Edinburgh and Glasgow. You've got a single track stretch of line as well, and the, the connection to Inverness, and Inverness has single track parts of the line as well to, to the central belt. So, there's infrastructure issues uh, there, and of course, there's well known issues I've already alluded to, certainly in terms of day nine, um, which is being addressed to Inverness uh, over, over a, a long period of time. But, you know, the small pieces of work that could be done, the relatively small pieces of work that could be done further north uh, that would open up, again, the economies of those areas. But looking at the southwest, I mean, it's, it's got clear strengths in terms of uh, its tourism sector in particular. Um, and it, 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 certainly connectivity would open up the potential for that tourist, that area as a tourist destination in Scotland. It's already very strong. It could be a lot stronger if it was easier for people to access. And uh, I think there is that sort of spine of the, the M74 going down. And when you come off that, going towards Dumfries and Galloway, um, it's, it's very difficult to access those areas. So there could be improvements made in those areas that could develop the local economy. But hitherto, yeah, there's been a lot of necessary focus in the central belt. I think there's an opportunity to spread that out. Would anyone else care to comment? I think this is more a, an issue of Scottish Government strategy than it is about how the networks go about their business. I mean, at the moment, we have a key sector-led strategy that is pretty much blind, I would argue, to the spatial growth issues that you've described in your question. And I think it ultimately will need to be supplemented by an approach that looks at the goods and services that are produced and consumed by everybody on a daily basis and how they are produced and disseminated and how through various ways of social franchising, these goods and services might be able to be, you know, the production of these goods and services might work better for local communities. If you want to hear more about this, come to our conference next Wednesday. There will be a major presentation on it. But uh, I think it's difficult to... Well, I, th you know, I think back to a, a meeting I was at in Cumnock just about this time last year that came after the... Um, the collapse of the Scottish surface mining sector 
in the presentation on a new development strategy for East Ayrshire at that meeting was all predicated on how East Ayrshire might connect to Scotland's key sectors and how it might build more Indigenous small businesses. Now, to me, that's doomed to failure because at some point you'll have to acknowledge, well, actually, it doesn't have the assets to connect to Scotland's key sectors. And secondly, you'll be creating more small businesses to fail in what is a very weak uh, local market. So you have to look at things like utilities, supermarkets, retail banking, the public sector, these goods and services, as I say, they will always continue to be produced in that a, a geographical area and see through the various social franchises on which they rely, ways in which the quality of employment might be improved in those areas. Oh, on a related um, matter, it's now a, a number of years since economic development funding was uh, devolved to local authorities. Certainly in my part of the world, there's a perception that they, there's no more economic development funding <laughs> as opposed to the fact that it's now managed by the council. And do you think that <coughs> is working well or do you think there are improvements there? Um, that's since the, you know, they did away with local enterprise companies and give the money to the... To yeah, the I, mean, I, I think that's a perception that exists in, in, in many places across the country. I think that said, and, and you know, as Stephen has already uh, mentioned earlier, I think, you know, we would certainly have examples from our membership of uh, companies who would say they've had very good general support from, from Scottish enterprise in that part of the world. Um, but, uh, but there's other companies who would say we don't feel touched at all by uh, any investment being made at a national level in terms of business growth. Um, I think it is a mixture of how you engage with those businesses. I think you know, you've got to look at the existing networks that are there, whether that's a local authority network, chamber of commerce network, um, you know, any other business organisation that, that, that has a footprint in, in the Dumfries and Galloway area, and look at, look at those areas as potential ways which you can engage with businesses and ensure that they don't feel disenfranchised by what is in essence a, a, a change in accounting. Um, uh, because I, I think there is still very much support available for these businesses. I mean, I've mentioned you know, the Business Mentoring Scotland programme, which is operated or funded by, operated by Scottish Chambers of Commerce, but funded by um, Scottish Enterprise and works very closely with Dumfries and Galloway. And the, the example I made there earlier about the attachment for carrying cans of paint was, was, was a local business in, in that area, which is now operating globally. So, um, uh, I, I, you know, there are support mechanisms available. It's a case of engaging the business community in that and finding the best route towards those businesses. Yeah. But in terms of the more general point about economic development funds being tr uh, transferred to, to local authorities, is, is that working well? I think there's areas of the country where... Um, our members have expressed satisfaction. There's areas of the country where members have expressed dissatisfaction uh, with that. Um, so it's very much a mixed picture in our experience. Yeah, uh, mixed would be my view too. I mean, the nature of dealing with you know 30 odd local authorities is there are some uh, good examples uh, in individual sectors and, and not so good examples in individual sectors. The you know we tend to find in our set what works is business led approach. So it needs to be businesses locally thinking about actually what is their response to a national strategy of growth. Um, and it's then about industry leading and public sector aligning. Now, where that doesn't happen, you need a catalyst to make it work. And often you have the right individual in a local authority are the catalyst for that. And they really drive it. And there's brilliant examples across a number of local authorities where that works. Where that isn't the case, it's more difficult and it needs to be a business-led approach, forming local networks around particular sectors, cross-sectorally potentially, which then drive the development of activity at a, a, a local level. But I don't see, and maybe I, I don't, and you know, the other three here can will have a, a greater sense of other sectors. I don't see a big central belt issue with food and drink, and that's partly because the nature of a lot of the production um, base and manufacturing base is in some of the most peripheral and remote parts of Scotland, but maybe we're just in a, in a, a, a more diverse position than, than other sectors, which I would recognise. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll just come back on that very, very briefly. I think for those parts of the country um, where... It's been expressed to us that the, the, the local authority system isn't working. Um, I think that's where uh, almost almost exactly the opposite of what James has, has, has just said is happening, where instead of an industry-led approach and a business-led approach, 
um, you're finding a greater gravitation of not just the economic development services, but every other service towards the local authority, and the local authority is, is, is hoovering up contracts for delivering services to businesses. And that's, that's business is not happy with that in parts of the country. So it's not so much the initial distribution, it's the fact that some local authorities are just becoming too much of a controlling influence on, on a wide range of aspects locally. Yeah, I think the only what the answer is, I don't really know. Uh, I mean, a second or third, the view that the experience has probably been mixed. Certainly heard of some uh, good examples around the country where these funds have been used in conjunction with employability funds to m improve kind of in, uh, access to work or active employment market pro uh, programmes. Also heard some problems with long-standing local economic development programmes that seem to fall in between two stools in terms of funding. But again, I think it's quite important to remember that although the sums that were devolved to local authorities might look sub substantial in nominal terms, there were never sums that were going to be transformatory in terms of the local economic development. Again, I think we should recognise that. Um, Alison Johnson. Um, you might be interested to know, speaking about Dumfries and Galloway, that, that last year at the Business and Parliament um, conference, I promised to go on the lagging zip wire, and that will be happening next week. Um, <laughs> yeah, apparently it's... Apparently, <laughs> you've not tried it, have you? <laughs> no, that's that's a farmer who's diversified um, and, and now has lagging outdoor limited, so I'll, I'll report back, hopefully. Um, I kind of wanted to go back to the the discussion we had earlier on apprenticeships, because we are constantly referring to Germany's success, but there seems to be a bit of a, almost an acceptance that we can't replicate that. Now, I know you can't just pick and choose the bits of, uh, you know, different economies that you'd like and try and stick it onto your end, onto your own. But, you know, obviously the Wood Commission has, has reported, and there's been a lot of talk about parity of esteem between academic and vocational routes. And it, I think, Stephen, you suggested that as Scottish businesses, just there's a sort of cultural resistance almost now, or just maybe a lack of commitment to taking on young people. Could we use the budget to incentivise that more? I mean, what do you think, what do you think are the barriers? Because obviously there's huge benefits, because we have far too many young people in low-skilled, low-paid work you know it's simply going nowhere and that has all sorts of repercussions so what do you think we might do with the budget to to boost apprenticeships and make them really meaningful and make sure that they lead on to something more meaningful yeah. can i just clarify what i said earlier on i mean what i'm trying to get at is i mean if you look at the american higher education system that's the best funded in the world because alumni feel the obligation to continue contributing to their university now that obligation is difficult to replicate in other jurisdictions. Similarly, in Germany, employers feel a cultural obli strong obligation to train young people, even if it might not be in their immediate, immediate economic interests. Again, whilst we can replicate the institutional frameworks, etc., replicating that cultural obligation has proved, I would argue, over a sustained period of time now, impossible to replicate in other jurisdictions, in, including Scotland. So, it's not, I'm not arguing, I don't think we can learn, we should never try to stop learning from what happens elsewhere, but I think kind of thinking that we can copy the institutional frameworks in Germany and you know some of the funding mechanisms and expecting that we will see similar outcomes, I think is just not going to happen, but that's, that's where we are. So absolutely within the context of where we are, we should be looking at what we can do. I think it's under discussed at this moment in time as the labour market recovers just quite how stubbornly resistant to active labour market policy say youth unemployment has been. I think that's intimately related to the rapidly rising and again under discussed employment rate of the over 65s, which I would argue is probably the most remarkable feature of the labour market in the last year. The only age category to see their employment rate actually increase on their pre-recession high and that is having an immediate knock-on impact in terms of entry level jobs to young people. So yeah, I mean I think the, the Wood Commission's a very good bit of work. If the Scottish Government can find additional funds through the budget to support employer incentives which of course as always have to be linked to quality of job and job sustainability if it can do that then that's all to the good and it remains just as pressing a concern now as it did two or three years ago Thank you Would anyone else like to comment on that issue? Um, yeah I think um, I'd, I'd agree absolutely with, with Stephen that, that Wood is um, uh, 
got to be central in terms of the Scottish government's approach uh, now to skills. And I agree that um, uh, you know businesses, certainly in terms of what the, Wood, the challenge that Wood has set out um, uh, to businesses to to get involved at an early stage in schools uh, and a consistent level across the country is something that we would certainly encourage our members. Uh, to take advantage of because we do have um, schemes operating in various parts of Scotland, um, uh, Renfrewshire and, and, and Ayrshire spring to mind, also Glasgow, um, where uh, there are great examples of businesses getting engaged very early on uh, in the school curriculum, ideally actually in primary school. Uh, although I'm, I don't think we've gone that far yet in, 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 in our um, examples, but but secondary school examples. I mean, in Renfrewshire, every single secondary school is a member of the local chamber and the local chamber gets businesses in there and not only gets businesses into schools and young people out of schools into work placements, but also gets teachers out of schools into work placements to find out a bit more about, about industry as well. So there's great examples going on. We would certainly encourage businesses to step up to the plate. We want Wood to be central to what the Scottish Government has, is going to be doing in terms of skills both this year and into the future um, and it is about um, business taking its full uh, share of um, responsibility in that. Okay. Can I maybe ask James Withers a question? Um, you know, we, we see young people far too often in, uh, well, they seem to be the majority of staff in certain fast food restaurants, um, you know, in this city and elsewhere. Are there opportunities for you know, really quality apprenticeships within the food and drink industry? There is, yeah, and uh, when we get to the committee, the latest figures where uh, the apprenticeship take-up is in food and drink, but it's, it's certainly gone through the roof compared to where it was. Um, and there's now a skills investment plan around food and drink in recognising that apprenticeship is sort of is part of the jigsaw you want in terms of future skills. Part of it is about education uh, uh, and, and interaction with schools, which uh, Gary just talked about. So, But the apprenticeship... Um, seen in food and drink is good it's not still where we'd want it to be we'd still be more ambitious but actually um it started to transform over the last few years but it, it's for us it's been about the part that apprenticeship plays amongst the wider skills agenda is there any particular area that young people are attracted to within your industry um I think the internationalisation side is definitely uh, of, of real interest. Um, I think one of the challenges we have is particularly we're looking at, you know, if you're interested in the salmon uh, farming industry or aquaculture, for example, you're likely going to be in the middle of nowhere as far as your average apprenticeship would, it would envisage. So it's all linked to services and costs and connectivity. Um, some of the work's quite seasonal as well. Um, but, you know, the areas of the sort of changing trends around sustainability... Um, around innovation, logistics and the international piece is starting to generate greater interest in food and drink than it was a few, a few years ago. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to comment? Yeah, I think Kate? we're all signed up to the Wood Commission as being core way of moving forward and supporting that. If the government can support that, um, that would be very welcome. I think there's lots of issues around giving visibility and prominence to good practice that's ongoing. I think we're probably all doing quite a lot with employers in terms of young um, young person employment issues and apprenticeships. We are very engaged with Skills Development Scotland and the Modern Apprenticeship Weeks that they have and the, the various initiatives coming up from that, signing up to the skills investment plans for key sectors as well. But I do agree with other colleagues talking about interventions with young people at the earliest possible stage. And one example... Um, is SCDI's network of young engineers and science clubs, which involves 12,000 young boys and girls, and girls in schools around Scotland now, and there's huge industry support for that. It is industry-led, recognising skills gaps and issues arising for industries in the future. So it's trying to give young people vision and excitement about the potential of um, engineering, technology and science disciplines apply to all kinds of industries, including food and drink, because we have a Science on the Menu programme, which is looking at the science of food. And that's really sort of exciting young people. The question mark is then how do we connect that up to industry opportunities? Mm -hmm. But um, that's something that we hope all of this activity will result in very practical opportunities for apprenticeships. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Uh, just as Alison Johnson has mentioned it, can I remind members, if they've not already done so, to uh, sign up for this year's Business and Parliament mm -hmm. Conference, which will take place at the beginning of November. 
Right, I think we've reached the end of our session, so can I, on behalf of the committee, thank you all gentlemen for coming along this morning and for your uh, input, which is very helpful to us in uh, informing our uh, budget uh, scrutiny uh, report. So thank you for coming, and we'll have a short suspension. Thank you.